The protagonist of this story, Aragi Kai, seemed to everyone around him to be an ordinary, gloomy teenager from high school. But in reality, he wasn't that simple at all. He was a professional assassin who terrified his victims, none of whom had ever escaped. Aragi Kai's classmates hated him and bullied him because of his antisocial character and weird aura. But everything changed one day when Aragi and his classmates were suddenly transferred to another world. A world of swords and magic. A mysterious messenger announces to them all that they are all heroes called to this world to defeat the Demon King. And for such a daunting task, she bestows them with superpowers. And obviously, Aragi Kai gets the most powerful one of all. Well, if you want to know which one, let's start this story from the beginning and get to the bottom of it. The scene starts with a man running through a dark alley. He looked anxious and afraid as he came to a stop. He looked back and thought that maybe he got away somehow, but then suddenly, someone put a knife against his throat. He told the assassin that he would give him money if he wanted it in return for his life, but the very next second, the assassin slit his throat. The next morning, a young schoolboy was on his way to school and he looked tired. His name was Aragi Kai. He yawned and thought that after working all night long, it really sucked to go to school. He worked as an assassin. When he entered his classroom, other students began whispering among themselves. A boy named Midu Shuji greeted him with a wide smile. He was the soccer club's ace and the class president. Kai returned his greeting coldly and sat down at his desk. Meanwhile, a girl named Nagase Reina saw it all and commented that Kai was rude as always. She was a fashionable girl who stood out from the rest of the girls in the class. She went to Shuji and told him sternly that he need not greet people like Kai. Shuji defended him by saying that he might be tired. That's why he was so cold. Suddenly, another student entered the classroom, and upon seeing him, Rina remarked how an even ruder person just entered. The rude student's name was Arashi Shunsuke, the leader of a notorious local gang. A few students greeted Arashi, but when he saw that Kai was sleeping, instead of greeting him, he went to his bench and yelled at him to get up. He drew his hand to grab him, but Kai grabbed his hand before he could react and said that he was sleepy and asked what he wanted from him. He let go of his hand, and Arashi called him a weirdo. Suddenly another student named Kenzaki Rin asked them to be quiet. She was beautiful and talented both in martial arts and literature. She was the cool and aloof top beauty of the school. He confronted her but was cut short by another girl named Hashimoto Mirei, who was a serious disciple committee girl who really cared about order. Watching her ready to fight Arashi, a boy named Narumi Yoshia told her that Arashi would just blow her away. Yoshia was a shallow and frivolous guy. Everyone soon got back to their seats. This was Shinzo High School. First year, class, and it was just another regular day in a class with a lot of problems. Kai was still keeping his head down when he suddenly sensed something. A weird sensation coming from under Shuji's feet. A bright blue light began emitting from the floor and a magic spell circle appeared. Soon everyone in the class noticed it and were confused and shocked. The magic circle grew in size and covered the entire classroom floor. Shuji instructed everyone to leave the classroom but Kai knew that they would not make it in time. Soon the bright light blinded everyone. They were all teleported inside what looked like an old castle. Everyone was lying unconscious on the ground, and Kai was the first to come back to his senses. He noticed that the building was made of stone with several large pillars to take cover, and there was only one exit. Soon the other students also began coming back to their senses. Everyone was panicking, but Shuji calmed them down, and Kai was relieved that Shuji was someone who could keep the whole class from losing their composure. Arashi got up and said that they could not waste any time, and he asked his two minions to follow him. Kai stopped him and said that he could hear footsteps coming towards them from the other side of the door. Kai sensed that there was a man and a woman coming through. Soon the door opened and a girl and an old man entered the room. They both looked like medieval knight and princess and were wearing unusual and old-fashioned flowy clothes with capes. The girl greeted the students saying that they were impressive and called them hero candidates. The students were surprised to see them. Kai analyzed both of them and concluded that the man had the physique of a sword user and he had his guard up too. And as for the girl, he sensed slight muscles, but she seemed pretty normal to him. The girl introduced herself as Leonora, the Archbishop of the Holy Country, Digarest, and the man with her was Gaius, who was a knight and her protector. Arashi told her that he had never heard of the country before and asked her if she was messing with them. The girl replied that she certainly was not messing with them. Shuji came forward and explained to her that they suddenly found themselves there and were thus a little bit on edge. The girl began explaining the entire thing to them. She began by saying that they were summoned to a parallel world as a hope for humanity to defeat the evil demon king. They were the parallel world's hero candidate. It was hard for the students to believe something like that. Gaius told Arashi to watch his mouth while talking to the saint of the country. Arashi was unfazed by this, and this made Gaius draw his sword, but Leonora pacified him. 
Arashi jumped at Gaius, and Kai was amazed by his bravery. Before Arashi could land an attack, Gaius flung his sword and made a little cut on his head. His attack was so fast that no one saw it. Leonora apologized for his aggression and said that she would explain everything to them in detail, but for that, they all had to be quiet and listen to her. Her demeanor suddenly changed from being calm to being scary. She explained that because of the Demon King's invasion, humanity of that world was facing extinction. The country of Diggerest continued resisting, but they did not have the power to completely stop the invasion anymore. Kai thought that the story was a pretty common one. She continued that they were the last hope of humanity. Upon hearing this, the students replied that they could not do this as they had never fought before. Some of the girls were already crying. Gaia said that it might sound impossible, but they would have to try as there was no way for them to return to their own world unless they defeat the Demon King. The students were even more shocked upon hearing this. Kai knew that he only said that to motivate them. He thought that the people who had always lived peacefully could not just suddenly start killing, as for that they needed experience and talent. Arashi got up with blood on his head and cursed them for dictating them. He added that he hated people like them. Gaius noticed that Arashi's spirit was still unbroken and wondered if he could be a useful warrior. Gaius held his sword and decided to kill Arashi, as he could be trouble to them, but before he could do anything, he saw that Leonora was healing Arashi's wound. She explained that the power she was using was called the system and was granted to them by their gods. She simplified it for them and said that it was just like magic from their world. Kai noticed that she knew about their culture and wondered if she had previously also summoned people from their world. She walked toward Shuji while saying that the power was the reason why she summoned them all there. She raised her hands and Shuji's wrist began glowing and soon he had a sword made of light in his hand. She further explained that they could wield the power of the system and awaken their innate abilities of divine protection. She said that she knew she had a selfish request as she called them all there and now they could not leave and asked them to lend her their powers. Shuji said that no matter how much power they gave them, they still could not fight right away. She replied that they will indeed be trained and during their training will be taken care of. Shuji took control of the situation and told his classmates that he knew they were scared, but the first thing they needed was information and protection. He told them that they should hear them for now and the classmates agreed with him. When Leonora saw that they all were ready to lend their hands, she began giving them their divine powers. Mireri was given telekinesis. Arashi got explosion powers. Rina received fire powers. Yoshia received wind powers, and others also received different and amazing powers. Leonora asked if anyone was left, and Kai raised his hand. She gave him his powers too, and he noticed that his field of vision was changing, and as soon as he finished getting his powers, he could read Leonora's stats. His eye color changed to red, and Leonora told him that he had received the power of judgment, which was rather rare. The power would let him see his target's stats and details. He tried his powers on himself, and he was able to see his own stats. Arashi also tried his powers and made fun of Kai by saying that he only got a new eye color. Kai noticed that the students were acting high and mighty. They didn't even have much information about the world yet, and their powers were also borrowed and could be taken away any time. But he was chill because he had plenty of other ways to kill people. After everyone received their powers, Leonora told them to take some rest. In the evening, the hero candidates were taken to their personal rooms. Kai sneaked out of his window in search of more information. Outside guards were patrolling and talking about how the hero candidates looked weak. They made fun of how those kids are chosen to defeat the Demon King. One of them said that the saint surely knows something which they do not. Kai listened to their chat entirely. He used his judgment power to check the stats of one of the guards and noticed that he only knew swordsmanship. He soon left in search of more information. He had also learned about the structure of the city, which was a fortified city. He wanted to get inside the inner castle, but the gates were heavily guarded so it was hard to sneak in. He decided not to rush things and come back another time. Meanwhile, in an open field, Rena was looking for a good spot with her two minions. They were there to practice their new powers. They began conjuring their respective elements and observing them as Rena was curious to know more about the whole divine protection stuff. Kai was hiding in a bush and spying on them when he suddenly felt a strange sensation. The girls also heard a weird noise coming from the bushes. It was a giant lizard-looking creature and was attracted by the girls' magic. Kai quickly used his magic to see the monster's stats, and he was shocked by its overwhelming stats. Soon, the monster roared and began chasing the girls. Kai concluded that the lizard was strong and aggressive, but it only ran in a straight line and also lacked intelligence. He threw a knife at it and the knife successfully penetrated his thick skin. Meanwhile, Rena stumbled and fell on the ground. The monster had caught up to her and was about to step on her when suddenly it stopped moving. When the girls looked around, they saw a knife puncturing its head and it was bleeding. They wondered if someone had saved her, but they decided not to stay there anymore. And they left. Kai had no reason to save them, 
but conscience did not let him ignore the situation. He thought to himself that things were not going to be easy around there if monsters like those were freely roaming around. He went near the monster's body to pick his knife when he suddenly sensed someone near him. He hid behind the monster's body and looked around, but did not see anyone. He went back to his room too to avoid any trouble. After he left, a person came out from behind a wall. The person was covered in a robe, thus making it impossible for anyone to look at their face. The person smashed the monster's head, squeezing out its eyes. He said to himself that he was disappointed after seeing how useless and weak the hero candidates were, but Kai smelled just like him. The next morning Gaius brought the dead monster's body to the hero candidates who were shocked to see something like that. Gaius explained that the monster was found dead last night near the royal capital. He continued that the demon king drove the monsters to a frenzy and as a result they craved human flesh. He told the hero candidates that they would be fighting things like that monster. Gaius asked Steady, who was a researcher, if he found anything weird about the monster and he replied that there were traces of sorcery being used. Probably by a demon above mid-grade. He said that maybe they were scouting to see the lower of the new hero candidates. Kai wondered if sorcery was different from magic since it was a new word used by the researcher. Shuji asked if it meant that the monster was controlled by a demon. Steady explained that strong demons can use servitude spells and hence could control weaker monsters. Gaius dragged Steady away, but he wanted to explain more. Kai deemed Steady a great help in gathering information. He could use his help. He suddenly realized that the true identity of those eyes he felt back then last night was a demon. The demon was skillful because Kai barely noticed him. He thought that the demon might be around them right at that moment. He suddenly felt someone looking at him. Arashi told Gaius that they could not get back to their world without killing the demon anyway, and he did not plan to stay in that world for long. The other students also agreed with him. Kai thought that it was best that they quickly learn the weight of the truth. Suddenly, Leonora walked in and told them not to be afraid, as they just did not know how to use their powers yet. All they needed was some training. Since they were from a different world, their growth rate would be different from the people of that world. And so, a week had passed since the students started training. Kai was reading books in the library, and he already could understand every letter of the new language. He thought that it was strange enough that they could talk to each other in the first place. His judgment power was not fit for battle, so he was left out of the training but was allowed to enter the library. He could not find many books on their history and culture and even not about demons. The strongest five among them were Narumi the Wind Controller, Arashi with his explosion powers, Kenzaki with her telekinesis, Hashimoto with her land power, and Rina with her fire powers. However, there was another person with a clearly extraordinary growth rate. It was Shuji. He grew stronger than the people he learnt swordsmanship from. Kai used his judgment power and noticed that all his stats were above B grade, and just last week they were below D grade. Suddenly two boys came to Kai and began making fun of him, and he noticed that even the others were looking down at him. They were growing impudent after getting their new powers. One of the boys tried to bully Kai, but Kai sneakily threw him on the ground. Meanwhile, Leonora and Gaius arrived at the training ground. She announced that since they all had grown quicker than she had imagined, she had decided to move their plans forward. Narumi asked her if she was planning to send them to fight the Demon King, but she refused it, saying that she wanted them to now practice fighting monsters. Everyone looked anxious when they heard it. The next day, Gaius and Leonora took all the hero candidates to the middle of a forest, and Gaius explained that they were there for combat drills. It was a place full of Obstarso, they could not move as freely as one group. That's why they were going to be divided into teams of two to three people. Hearing these, all the hero candidates made their own groups leaving Kai and Kanzaki alone. They had no choice but to team up with each other. Kai thought that she had a confident and apathetic personality and also she was proud. She caught him staring at her. Meanwhile, Leonora announced that since it was a special occasion, so the team which will defeat the most monsters would receive a surprise reward. Soon the combat drills began. On their way, Kanzaki told Kai that her powers were superior to everyone else's, so she did not need him to do anything. She asked him not to stand in his way. Kai accepted the offer and said that he would leave everything to her. Seeing this, she asked him if he did not have any pride. He sensed four entities around them who were hiding. One of the monsters rushed at them and Kenzaki used her powers. Her power was called Domination, and it was an ability that enforced the user's orders on their target. She ordered the goblin to bow down, and he did exactly that. She looked visibly tired after a few minutes. She explained to him that she used to get tired when she used her powers for too long because it consumed a lot of mana. He asked her to just kill the goblin because another monster was about to attack, but she was a little hesitant because to her the monster looked a bit like a human. Kai put sense in her by saying that it was a monster after all, which tried to attack them earlier. He picked a stone and concluded that she was just a naive student from Japan who was too used to peace. He was playing with the store when suddenly the other three goblins also appeared. 
She ordered the goblins to bow down and ask Kai to help him instead of just standing there. Kai replied that she was the one who asked him not to get in between. She sighed and ordered the goblins to twist their own necks, and this killed them. He was amazed to see that she could enforce such orders too, to which she replied that the more difficult the order was, the lower were the chances of success. She was disgusted to see the corpses of the goblins, but Kai comforted her with his words of wisdom. She asked him how he could be so calm when he did not even have powers. He told her not to worry about him as this was his strong point. He asked her if she wanted to return if she was too scared of it all, but obviously she denied the proposal with pride. He knew that she was just trying to look brave, but he also admitted that she was not too bad after all. Meanwhile, Narumi and Hashimoto were running from a monster who was too strong for them. But running was not an option for them, so they decided to attack the monster together using their wind and rock powers. They hit the monster with a giant boulder, but it barely scratched it. They were helpless and did not know what to do next. Kenzaki wanted to go back to her world as she had not repaid her grandfather for raising her yet. She really wanted to show him how much she had grown up. She was lost in her thoughts when Kai asked her if she wanted to keep going since they could get lost. They both got into a banter, and she wondered why Kai was so mysterious and stubborn. They were messing around when suddenly they heard a loud noise. Kanzaki recognized the voice to be Hashimoto's. Kai asked what they should do, and she replied that they should obviously help her. Meanwhile, Hashimoto was thrown feet away by the monster, and she was wounded and bleeding. She asked Narumi to run away, but it was too late as the monster was about to attack him too. Kanzaki used her powers and ordered the monster to stop. Narumi thanked her, and she said that the monster was too powerful and could not be halted for too long. Kai asked Narumi if Hashimoto was alive, to which he replied that she was, but she was really injured. Kai asked her to carry her on his back and get out of there. He was reluctant to leave, but seeing her condition, he left. When he left, Kai used his powers to see the monster's stats and was amazed to see some pretty high stats, especially the defense. He knew his attacks would not damage him a lot, and he also noticed that it was a mutant, and he wondered what it was exactly. Kenzaki yelled that she could not hold it anymore, and he told her that she had bought them enough time and they should run away too. She agreed seeing the situation, but she could not use her legs anymore because she had used all her energy into stopping the monster. Seeing how bad the situation was, Kai pulled out a smoke grenade and triggered it. This bought him some more time to grab Kanzaki and hide away. She was a little flustered for being carried in his arms. She asked him what the smoke was, and he explained that it was a smoke grenade which he had made while they all were training. He was lying as he had some equipment on himself before being summoned. Since it was not much, he did not want to use them carelessly. They were basic assassin equipment. Kanzaki apologized to him since she was the one who said that they should go and save them, and she ended up being saved herself. Kai asked her not to say sorry instead, she could thank him. Again, a banter between them followed. She said that they should run away, but he replied that there was no need for that. They both saw Shuji and others arriving at the location, and without wasting any time, he attacked the bear for hurting his friends. Shuji swiftly attacked the monster and injured its hand. Rina jumped in and used her fire powers at the monster, but it didn't seem to affect it much except for slowing it. They again jumped at the monster. All the while, someone was watching them from a distance. It was a veteran assassin demon named Delphus. Delphus smirked and said to himself that the armored monster could not beat the hero candidates because of their quick growth. He liked how calm they were, especially Shuji. It was supposed to be a scouting mission, but it was time for a change of plans. He decided to end them there. Meanwhile, Shuji and the others were able to defeat the monster. Delphus grinned and was about to attack them when suddenly he was stopped by a dagger on his neck. It was Kai. Delphus was stunned to be caught like that. He was stressed and wondered how Kai was able to get behind him. He needed a way to quickly escape. Kai slashed his legs and threw him on the ground. He asked him not to make noise as he did not want Shuji and the others to notice him. Kai said that if he would answer some of his questions, then he would let him go. Delphus was not ready to give up, but he had no other choice as Kai had the upper hand. Kai wondered if the person who was watching him the other night was him only. Kai said that he knew they were being watched, and it was his plan to let Shuji and the others to fight so that he could be lured out. Cutting him short, Kai said that he needed information since it had not been long since they came to this world, and he would have to tell him whatever he would ask him. Delphus smirked and declined, but Kai slashed his hands too and said that it would be easier if he just cooperate. Delphus told him not to underestimate him and saying that he consumed some poison he was carrying, thus killing him on the spot. Kai understood that the army of the Demon King would not be easy to fight with. Suddenly Kenzaki came to him and was shocked to see the dead body lying near them. Kai asked her since how long was she watching, and she replied that since the person was on the ground. He explained to her that the dead demon was an assassin from the Demon King's army, and the monster from earlier was his pawn. And back when the first lizard monster was seen, 
that too was his doing. She was scared a little to know that the Demon King was trying to kill the hero candidates. She asked him how did he notice the assassin when no one else did. He thought that there was no reason to hide his secret, and he confessed to her that his family was in the assassination business, so he could smell that he was in the same line of work. Kanzaki was shocked upon this revelation. He told her that it was upon her to believe, and also asked her not to tell anyone about the dead body, as the hero candidates were already shaken by Hashimoto's condition. She agreed to him and said that she did not know that he cared about them so much, to which he replied that it was simply because they were not used to fighting like him. All the hero candidates gathered around Hashimoto, who was severely injured and lying on the floor. A student named Hano, who had healing powers, sat down near her and used her powers to heal her. Everyone was amazed to see her powers. She announced that Hashimoto would be healed in about an hour. Hero candidates were praising Shuji for defeating the monster. Suddenly, Leonora and Gaius walked in, and the candidates asked them where they were all this time, and why did not they help them when they needed it. Gaius explained that he was there all the time, keeping an eye on them, and that it would not be a good practice if he just saved them every time. Shuji said that the condition was severe, and Hashimoto could even lose her life, to which Gaius replied that putting one's life on the line was a natural part of practical military drills. That was the kind of battle they would be facing going forward, and thus they should not be making feeble complaints. Shuji questioned him when he said that the area only had weaker monsters, then how did the armored monster appear? Leonora said that it must be because of the demon assassin as armored monsters are not supposed to be in that area. Gaius and Leonora decided to strengthen their defenses as they didn't know that Kai had already killed the assassin. Leonora also added that they should be increasing their level of training as at their current level, they would all just die. Everyone was scared to hear that and Shuji tried to talk some sense to her, but she told him that getting stronger was the only way to live. Arashi did not like that they were being ordered around, and he jumped in to talk to Leonora, but Gaius stopped him and then said that they were all just pawns of Leonora, and they should not think that they could just disobey her orders. The situation was getting heated up, and Shuji jumped in to calm Arashi down, as they had no other option other than to obey them. Gaius was impressed by Shuji, and he told the candidates not to worry as they were important pawns for the country, and they would not do anything bad to them, as long as they all acted properly. Arashi still was not satisfied and he attacked Gaius with his explosive power but Gaius was quick to evade it and he punched Arashi so hard that he fell to the ground. Saying that they all were weak and that from the next day things would only get tougher, he and Leonora left. Arashi got up with a bleeding face and swore to kill Gaius. The next day, Steady the researcher was in, in charge of the training. After a brief conversation about the last day, he said that they were going to fight monsters at his research facility. Inside the facility, all kinds of monsters were locked. He was raising those monsters for his experiment. Soon the drill began and hero candidates were made to fight monsters. Kai noticed that everyone was surprisingly calm even though they were forced to fight. Shuji told Steady that the monsters were strong for the candidates, but Steady replied that Lenora had asked him to be very strict with everyone, and thus he could not and would not ease the training. Besides, he added that hero candidates with peers like theirs should not be losing in the first place. He added that the most important thing was their will. Shuji asked if it would really make a difference, and he replied that if done correctly, then they could increase their power's level and could even give new derivatives of their power. Kai also joined them and told Shuji that according to his judgment power, he could see that Shuji had a new power. Shuji was surprised to hear that and asked Steady if he could test it out. Steady was excited to see the power himself, so he allowed him. Shuji used his new powers, and in an instant, he cut the monster's hand and head with a clean slash. Kai knew that Shuji would now not struggle with an armored monster. He wondered if his judgment powers were also leveled up. Kai noticed that someone else also had received a new power, and it was Arashi, but he decided not to tell him. Later that night, Arashi was planning to kill Gaius, tie up Leonora, and ask her the way to get back to their real world. A few other candidates were in his support, and excited to leave the world too. Arashi asked Narumi to join them as they would have a better chance, and he knew that Narumi was fed up with that world too. Narumi was hesitant, but in the end he decided to join his hand. The next day Shuji was training and Kai went up to him and said that he was really working hard. Shuji replied that he was still weak and needed to get better, to which Kai replied that with his current power level, he could defeat half the knights of that world. Shuji said that it was not enough as he could not defeat Gaius, and he needed more power to protect everyone. Kai asked him what he thought of Leonora and Gaius, and he replied he knew that they were using them as pawns in their battle, but he also knew they would not harm them. Kai asked if he meant that he would put his life on the line until the Demon King was defeated. Shuji agreed, and said that he had made up his mind, but he must be the only one that had to fight. He would become the country's hero and defeat the Demon King, and would try to negotiate and make sure everyone else could live safely in exchange. Kai asked if Leonora would allow him to do so, and just right then she and Gaius walked in. 
She told Steady that he would be in charge of the candidate's training while she would be away. Steady was glad to do his part, saying that she and Gaius left. Later, while on their way, Gaius asked her if she was sure that she made the right choice to which she asked what made him think that. He asked her not to play around and say it to the point. He added that Arashi was stirring something up, and she agreed saying that it might be a rebellion against them. He asked her next move and she said that she was curious to see what they would do next. Gaius was a little concerned about the rebellion, as after all they were hero candidates and had powers, so it could be disastrous for them. But Leonora was calm, as she knew they could not defeat her ever. She added that they should create a hierarchy so that they could crush the rebellion and break their fangs once and for all. She also told him that she could see some other suspicious things but would leave them for now. Later that night, Kai was fighting a monster and he killed him in the same way he killed the monster the first night. He only took 13 seconds, and when he used his judgment power on himself, he noticed that he had leveled up. Suddenly, another monster attacked him, but was one tough and his blades could not pierce him. This was the perfect time to test his new skill. He used his new power, which could detect the target's weak spot. Upon detecting the spot, he killed the monster in a blink of an eye. It was not a bad skill, but he needed more to survive in that world. He needed to get even stronger. More monsters attacked him and he defeated them too easily. He needed a bigger test subject to test his skill. He heard human footsteps and saw Kanzaki and asked her what she was doing there so late at night. She said that she was looking for him since he was not in the dorm. He asked her to leave as the forest was a dangerous place to be at night. He was used to fighting at night, but she was not. She shut him up and asked him what he was doing there anyway. He told her that he was testing his new powers. She asked him what was his Mew power, but he began messing up with her, and she confessed that she was worried for him. When confronted, she turned red and began making excuses. They were talking when suddenly they saw smoke rising from some distance. It was a fire. Their dorm was on fire. They both ran back and saw other candidates fighting monsters. Narumi said that he was glad to see them both. He said that when he woke up, he saw the fire and the monsters. Kai said that it was a human's doing and the ringleader had to be close by. He told them to find and catch whoever had done it. Steady appeared on top of the building and told them that their judgment was good. Kai said that he was wondering how the monsters appeared, but now it all made sense. They were all monsters from his laboratory. He has also given them some medicine to grow stronger since they were too weak to be of any use. Kai asked him what was objective and what benefit would he get from killing candidates. He told them it was a direct order from above. He was told to destroy the candidates even if it meant to throw away his current position. He smiled and said he did not have anything against them, but he would have to kill them sadly. They asked if it was Leonora's order, but he denied that by saying of course not as it was not that vixen's order. It was the Demon King's order. He was the Demon King's spy. He said that if he did the job right, he was going to be offered the post of a researcher over there too. Kai asked him if he had fallen so deep into darkness that all he cared about was high researching monsters. Steady said that monsters were way beyond human comprehension. He ordered his monsters to attack them and Kenzaki used her powers to halt them, but it was no use as they quickly broke her spell and attacked her. Kai jumped in and saved her and this excited Steady a lot as he was amazed by his powers. Kai continued killing the other monsters. He killed almost a dozen of them and Steady was now furious as Kai did not even have a strong power to begin with. He used judgment power on Steady and saw that all his stats were poor. But what caught his eyes the most was that he too had domination powers like Kanzaki, but even stronger, and that was the reason why Kanzaki's power was nullified. Steady was shaken and he used something which he did not want to use, but he had no choice. He told Kai that he would soon know what he used. Kai jumped up to attack him as he did not want to waste any time, but suddenly a giant red dragon spewed fire at him. This was Strady's trump card. The dragon began hurling boulders at them. Kai asked Narumi to take Kanzaki and leave as the next attack was coming. Kai again used his power to locate the dragon's weak spot, and it was its neck. He tried to cut it, but his attack power was not enough to do so. Suddenly Arashi appeared and attacked the dragon, and then began boasting about how he could hurt him, but the dragon counter-attacked him. Kai told Arashi that they need to take down the monster together. Arashi questioned him as to why he would need him to, which Kai replied that he could spot the weak points, but he did not have enough attack power. Arashi was being stubborn and said that he did not need help from a noob, but they did not have time for that as the dragon attacked again. The dragon spewed fire again at Arashi, and he finally decided to team up with Kai. Kai explained to him its weak point, which was a scale on its neck. Kai planned to get its attention while Arashi would attack at the weak point. Steady ordered the dragon to kill them. The dragon again rushed at them and Kai distracted it while Arashi attacked the weak point. This threw the dragon to the ground. The dragon was defeated and Kai asked Steady if he had anything else as his trump card had lost. Steady said that he still had other monsters but unfortunately Shuji and the others had already defeated them all. 
Steady tried to run away but was caught by Narumi. Kai asked him to tell them everything and he easily agreed as he was a coward. But before he could tell anything, his body turned purple and he died. A curse was put on him that would kill him the moment he tried to leak information. The next day, the candidates confronted Leonora when she returned as she was the one who left Steady in charge. She apologized and explained that she did not think that a weak demon tamer like him could cause so much damage. Candidates were shocked to know that she knew Steady was a demon tamer. They asked her that if she knew he was a demon, then why did she allow him to be near them? In her defense, she said that she had already told them that their training was going to be harder, and thus what happened was just a part of it. Gaius accused them for not being careful enough to see a fire at night. Leonora told them that they all will be visiting the royal capital next. Focusing on the reveal of the hero candidates, a public parade would be held in the royal capital, and they would be going on stage as leading actors. That evening, they all set out for the capital, and at night, they camped in a field. While eating, Arashi told his minions that there were around 30 soldiers with them, and they were really not that strong. He said that it was time to put their plan into action. They could easily outnumber them. He asked one of his minions to call Narumi and his group over. Kai was listening to his speech, and he agreed that there were very soldiers accompanying them. But it was only because Gaius and Leonora were confident that they could take them down themselves. He went to Shuji and asked him he, they could talk. Later that night, Arashi and Narumi met in the forest nearby. They were ready to attack the soldiers when Shuji and the other candidates came in their way to stop them. Shuji said that he had heard that Arashi was trying to kill Leonora and Gaius, and Arashi was shocked to know that his plan was leaked somehow. They tried to put some sense in him by saying that there could be another way to do it, other than simply killing them. Arashi told Shuji that all he did was talk, and asked him if he had a plan to which he replied that he would act as a pawn and defeat the demon king, and in exchange, he would guarantee everyone's safety. Arashi was not ready for this trade and told him to get out of his way, but Shuji and the others were not going to let him pass. Since they could not agree to a point, they began fighting. Suddenly two soldiers came in and told them to sleep since they had an early morning trip tomorrow. Arashi walked away saying that he had enough of the weakness and there was no point in talking to them. They all reached the royal capital the next day and it was too crowded because of the ceremony. People on the streets were amazed to see the hero candidates. The people seemed to have a lot of faith in them. At the castle they were greeted by holy knight reigns who asked them to rest first. All the candidates were pleased and happy to get the royal treatment, from fluffy beds to hot water baths. They were offered the best food too. Kai decided to gather some more information, but there were a lot of guards. He suddenly saw the knight who was showing them around. Reynas was talking to his soldiers about how he found the candidates stronger than normal children of their age. One of the soldiers said that he was worried that letting the hero candidates into the royal capital would surely incite those demons to take some action. Reynas told them not to worry as the candidates were strong and could take care of anything. Kai had more questions, so he thought of going to the town. At night, he went to one of the pubs and ordered ale and some snacks. People were talking about the hero candidates and how they looked like normal kids to them. He noticed that the people there were more afraid of the church than the king or nobles. He asked the bartender to tell him more. He said that he was new to town, thus he did not know a lot. The bartender told him about the demon king and the way he was attacking the kingdom. He also added that the demon king could even seduce humans with their overwhelming power. He also told him how the demon king's followers blew up a noble estate a few days ago. Kai left the pub thinking how the candidates being in the capital was surely not the best thing. Suddenly, Kenzaki came to him because she was worried for him. He explained to her that he was gathering information since they were in an unknown territory. She was visibly worried and said that she could help him, but he refused and she did not like his attitude. After a small banter, he finally agreed to let her help. He asked her to gather information about the royal capital. She left to gather information and so did Kai, but someone was listening to their entire conversation. The man smirked when he saw her leaving. Kai finally got back into his room after a tiresome search. He did not find anything important, but he at least learned the existence of a new enemy. He suddenly heard noises coming from outside his room, and when he went out, he saw the other candidates gathered in the hall. When he asked, he got to know that Kenzaki was missing. They didn't notice him gone too because he didn't share his room with anyone. When asked, he denied that he knew anything. Shuji concluded that she was not in the castle, and since it was almost dawn, they should go out and look for her. They all spread around to look for her. Kai found her student ID fallen on the street. As soon as he picked it up, four masked men attacked him, but his reaction time was so quick that he instantly took down three men. He asked the fourth one who he was since they all were pretty untrained spies. The fourth spy was too stunned to run away, and Kai asked him to tell everything he knew. Meanwhile, in what looked like a castle, Kanzaki was tied up and held. Two spies were interrogating her, but she was not answering them. They wanted to know about the hero candidates. 
When they saw that she was not cooperating, one of the spies ripped her shirt off. They did not know, but Kai was already inside and was spying on them. He used his judgment powers and noticed that they were pretty weak ones. He couldn't believe that she was captured by such weak men. He quickly killed them. Kanzuki was embarrassed to see him in her exposed state. He unlocked her chains and was about to leave when he sensed someone coming towards them at full speed. It was Reigns the Holy Knight, and he attacked them without wasting any time, but they both dodged his attack. He smiled and said that he must really kill them. Besides being the Holy Knight, he was also the general of the Demon King's army. Kai said that the country was close to its end because of how even the capital was full of enemies. Kai used his judgment and saw that Reynas was a powerful warrior. He was an all-rounder. They both clashed again, and Kai was able to dodge his sword. But then Reigns used fire magic, which caught Kai off guard. He somehow dodged the attack again, but then Reigns engulfed his sword with fire and said that it was over for Kai, but Kai quickly pulled out his gun and shot him right in the middle of his temple. Reigns fell down and died. Kai did not want to use his gun for something like that since he had limited bullets, but he had no other choice. He needed to learn how to fight face to face if he wanted to survive in that world. Kenzaki was stunned to see a gun with him and said how scary it was to learn that someone in the class carried a gun with him. He explained to her that it was just standard equipment for an assassin. She thanked him, and he asked her why she didn't use her domination power, to which she replied that after her hands were locked with the chain, she couldn't use her powers somehow. They were leaving, and she told him that those guys were trying to attack everyone from their class, but he already knew it while interrogating the fourth guy he had captured earlier. The fourth guy told him that they were ordered to kill all the hero candidates, and it was him who told her about Kanzaki's location. They wanted to use her as a hostage while attacking others. What they couldn't understand was the fact that he was not killed by the death curse like how Steady died. This meant that this was not done by a demon. This meant that some humans were against them. It was almost morning and Shuji found them and was glad to see her well. Kai told him everything about the Demon King's cult and how humans were against humanity too. The problem now was that they could not tell which humans were their enemies like they could tell with monsters. This meant that everyone needed to be more cautious. They decided not to tell Leonora as she would simply tell them to look at it themselves. So they ended up deciding to gather everyone and decide a course of action. Suddenly, a smoke appeared around them, and soon they were surrounded by more cult members. They all got ready to fight. Not only these three, but all the other candidate groups were also cornered by the men. Kai read that there were six of them, and their stats were obviously lower than Rainey's, but still they were strong. All the six men jumped at them. Kanzaki used her powers to halt them, and Kai pierced their heads with sharp knives, thus killing them instantly. Shuji was a little stressed to see it as they were all humans after all. Shuji tried to debate about it, but Kai shut him up saying that they were enemies at the end of the day. One remaining cult member attacked Shuji, and he tried to reason with him, but the cult member said that he was just serving his master. Kanzaki was ready to use her powers again, but Kai stopped her saying that he wanted Shuji to kill the man. Shuji broke the man's sword and asked him to surrender if he wanted to live. But the man was too stubborn and he attacked Shuji, injuring his hand. In a counterattack, Shuji slashed his body. The man was whimpering, and Shuji wanted to leave him there to die, but Kai told him to eliminate him there itself, or else he could be a threat. Shuji was reluctant, but he ended up doing just what Kai told him to do. Meanwhile, Arashi and his minions also defeated all the men. The last man was merciless, killed by Arashi's power. Rina and others were finding it difficult to kill humans, and except Rina, the other girls were getting injured. Suddenly, Leonora appeared at the scene and asked if she should give them the passing grade. The men grew angrier when they saw Leonora, and she said that since they were her candidates, it was to be expected that she would come and help them when they were in danger. One of the men said that she did not even have her knight with her, so how would she do it? She taunted them by saying that they were just a bunch of amateurs seduced by the demon king, and she did not even consider them as enemies in the first place. All the men jumped at her at the same time, and she used her domination power to stick all of them to the ground. The men could not move, and Rina said that her powers were just like Kanzaki, but Leonora asked her not to compare her powers to something like that as her domination skill was superior in every aspect, from range to power. Rina asked her why she saved them, to which she replied that she had mentioned about giving a passing grade. They all thanked her for protecting them, and one of the men held her dress and asked her not to ignore them and free them. She looked down and apologized to the man, for he was still alive. She then used her domination power on all the candidates and ordered them to kill the men lying on the floor. Their bodies began moving on their own, and they all killed all the men against their will. Such was the power of Leonora. Kai and Kanzaki were watching it all unfold from far away, and Kanzaki was amazed to see her able to control so many people at once. Her range and power was completely at a different level. Twelve hours after the attack, all the candidates gathered again in the hall. A lot of them were in a pretty bad state and shocked. 
Narumi said that he would not let her go as she made all the candidates kill against their will. Shuji was blaming himself for not getting there sooner, but Kai explained to them that it would not have made any difference, as none of them were currently strong enough to resist Leonora. Kai knew for a fact that since the demon army's general was defeated, they would not be able to make a move for a while. He then asked Kanzaki to come with him. She asked him the purpose, and he told her that in order to find a way to deal with Leonora's domination magic, he wanted the help of someone who had similar powers like her. He then asked her to dominate him, with her powers. Hearing this, she was flustered and all red. The day after they repelled the cult members, the kingdom held a massive parade celebrating the summoning of the hero candidates. This was the proof that the hero candidates displayed their power during their battle against the cult of the demon king. They were embraced with open arms by the royal capital citizens. When all the candidates gathered together, Leonora told them that she would like them to return to the temple city Alpha. Kai explained to the others that it was the name of the city they were summoned to, and he thought that it was under Leonora's control. He asked Leonora if she wasn't coming with them too. She replied that she still had some matters to take care of, so she would be leaving them all under Gaius's care. Rena said that they wished they could return, but their dorms were burnt down. Rena noticed that one of the girls was looking flushed and was not even able to answer the questions. She was too afraid of Leonora. Leonora left with a grin and all the candidates held resentment against her. Soon, Gaius took all the candidates with him towards their destination. At night they all camped and Arashi and the others again went into the forest. Kanzaki asked Kai if they were really going to do it that night, and he replied that Leonora was not there and all the soldiers were weaklings, and hence it was the best opportunity to kill Gaius. Under these conditions, there was no reason for him to stop them, and he would just enjoy the show. Meanwhile, Narumi had taken Gaius deep into the forest, saying that he had seen a giant monster. Gaius fell into his trap as the road led to the royal capital, and a monster lurking around there was dangerous. Suddenly, Arashi attacked Gaius from behind with his full power. Gaius was not expecting the attack and so he took the hit and began bleeding. Arashi told him that even his best attack couldn't kill him. Gaius was not steady on his feet and he suddenly stepped on a landmine which blew up. Arashi smiled and said that it was all a trap set up for him. Gaius used mana to defend himself but he still was injured greatly. Gaius said that he was disappointed in him as he didn't expect him to ambush him like that. Suddenly all the other members of Arashi's group surrounded the old man. Seeing the gravity of the situation, Gaius threw a light ball up in the sky which acted like a firework. Kanzaki and Kai also saw that from afar and Kai remarked how Arashi had messed up. The light ball was a distress signal and the soldiers saw it and went towards that direction. They could not reach the location since Kai got in their way and killed them all. Meanwhile, Gaius was getting beaten by the candidates. He could barely keep up with them and their powers. Soon he lost his one arm and was all red with blood. Arashi complimented him by saying that he was tough for his age. Narumi told them about the distress signal and said that he was trying to buy some time, but Gaius replied that there was no longer any need for that. Leonora walked in with her usual smile and said that Gaius was driven quite into the corner. The candidates were shocked to see her. At the same time, Shuji, Reina, and other candidates saw Kanzaki using her domination power to tie up some soldiers. She told them that she was following orders, but they did not buy it since they knew she was not the one who would follow someone's order. Kai came in and told them that she was following his orders. Shuji was again stunned to hear that he killed the guards. He explained that Arashi already had his hands full fighting Gaius, so he took care of the guards. Shuji and the others understood the entire thing now. Shuji asked him if he teamed up with Arashi, to which he replied that he was just doing what he wanted to do. Kai told him that he should be looking for Arashi rather than bugging him. Shuji and the others left to look for Arashi and the others. Leonora told Gaius that he was losing, and he accepted it saying that he could not fight his old age after all. Arashi said that after everything that has happened, he was not going to tuck his tail between his legs and run away. One of the candidates asked him if she wasn't the one who was controlling them. Leonora replied to this saying that there were also other conditions that were needed to be fulfilled. If they had a big mana pool to resist, it would not be that effective. But for those who always relied on their powers and were not used to controlling their mana, it was easy for her to control everyone. Arashi called her a coward and challenged her that she would not be able to fight them head on. She smiled and said that she would deal with them herself. She added that she would break his fangs. Arashi jumped at her and she quickly summoned a huge chunk of boulder and sent him flying. She then manipulated other elements like fire, water, and air to defeat the other candidates. Narumi came and picked up Arashi and flew up in the sky. Suddenly Shuji and the other candidates also arrived. He told Arashi to stop the fight and asked him what he would gain from it. Arashi told him to stop him with his strength if he wanted to, because he hated the pacifist methods of his. Shuji asked the others if they thought the same, and Rina stood up and said she supported Arashi. Leonora laughed and said that they were still fighting among themselves, 
She added that at that point they were responsible for starting a rebellion. She then asked them if they expected her to forgive them, even if they were to stop the rebellion at the moment. She then conjured a huge cyclone and injured everyone. Shuji was tense to see everyone hurt, but Arashi told him to calm down and said that if he wanted to protect everyone, then he would have to resolve himself or else everyone would be dead. Shuji understood the situation as there was no other way. He got ready to fight and so did Reina and the others. Leonora said that she would show them the difference between her and them. Meanwhile, not so far away, Kanzaki asked Kai what they should do. He told her that once Leonora uses her magic to enslave them, then he would join in. Until then, they should trust the other candidates. The candidates were ready to fight Leonora, and Gaius managed to get up and said that he was weak, but he still wanted to fight for her. Leonora healed all his wounds, and he was better than ever to fight. Candidates were scared, as they did so much to corner Gaius, but now he was back. Rena told him that their number had increased too, so they would make up for it. Leonora told them that they could attack her anytime they wanted. For her, the battle would be a test for them. She added that if they could not win against her, then they could not be a hero after all. Soon, the fight began, and Gaius noticed that it was difficult to fight Shuji with his magic sword. Leonora used water magic to attack Shuji, but Reina nullified it, but still he was injured by the attack. They attacked Leonora, but none of the attacks could even touch her. Meanwhile, Kai was hiding in the shadows, and he used his judgment to check Leonora's stats, and he noticed that although she was a powerful magician, her defense was weak. One good physical attack would be enough, but Gaius was in their way. Arashi asked Shuji to leave Gaius to him and go take down Leonora. Shuji had a problem though, and it was that his magic could not touch her either. One of the candidates gave him a steel sword, and Leonora commented that now he seemed ready for combat, finally. The other candidates could not help Shuji as their powers would not work on her, and they could not help Arashi either as he was fighting in close range. Arashi was able to go head to head with Gaius, because although he was healed, his stamina was still low, but he also could not use his explosive power so again it was equal. Leonora was using ranged attacks at Shuji so that he could not get close to her with his sword. There had to be something which he could do to get close and defeat her, but he did not know what it was. Leonora smiled and said it was expected of Shuji as there were very few people in the country who could dodge her attacks. It was still a one-sided battle since he was not close enough to her. He could not even rely on the other candidates. Shuji dashed at her with full speed and negated her wind attacks. She used ground and fire attacks too, but he dodged them. She noticed that he was unconsciously using magic as an armor, which meant that he was growing in such a short period of time. She was a little afraid of him, but she managed to throw him away with her powers. Meanwhile, Arashi could not rely on his powers anymore and was wondering what he could do to beat Gaius. Gaius slashed his abdomen in one strike. Arashi was angry at himself for not being able to defeat an old man. He knelt on the ground and Gaius told him that this was how far he could go without his powers. Arashi told him that he was meant to be strong, and he then punched him so hard that the old man fell to the ground, bleeding again. He won. Meanwhile, Shuji thought that he had to win, or else his friends would have to suffer. He got up, and a menacing aura surrounded him. Leonora noticed his astounding stamina, but was pretty chill as she knew he could not get close to her. She was wrong, as in a blink of an eye, Shuji was right in front of her, and he managed to slash her hand. It was impossible according to her, but she had no time to think, as now Shuji was right behind her. She managed to use water powers to push him away somehow. She understood that he had gained instant movement powers. He again used his new power and was just an inch away from slicing her neck when suddenly she commanded him to kneel down. He could not move and she smiled and said that she did not want to use it, but she had no choice. Kai noticed that she had finally used her trump card and he asked Kenzaki to move. Leonora smirked and said that she did not expect to use enslaving magic, but Shuji made her do it. He was lying at her feet like a statue. Other candidates rushed to save Shuji, but Leonora commanded them to not move, and they all stopped midway. Leonora said that they all did a good job, and thus she would give them a passing grade. She added that she did not expect Gaius to lose, but after all, he was just a knight and could be replaced. As long as she controlled them, it would not be a problem. The candidates were losing hope, and if they did not have any countermeasures, then they would surely lose. She told them all that the reason why they allowed her to summon the candidates was so that when the time came, she could control them freely. Otherwise, they would become threats. Suddenly, three knives attacked her from behind, but she easily dodged them and said that she knew he was hiding the whole time. It was Kai, and he replied that he was surprised that she paid attention to someone as ordinary as him. She said that from the beginning there was something odd about him. She said that she was disappointed in him because she did not expect him to come out to a losing battle like that. She ordered him to not move, and he too was under her spell. She was explaining her magic when suddenly a bullet hit her shoulder. She was surprised to see that he could move and fire even under her spell. She asked him how he could do so as she was sure that she was using her magic on him. 
He again shot her in her abdomen, and she couldn't understand what weapon it was, since guns weren't a thing in her world. Her defense could not keep up. He explained to her what a gun is, and also said that he had few bullets, and he did not want to use them. She used her firepower, but only his robe was hit by the fire, and he wasn't there anymore. The next second, he was standing right behind her with his gun aimed at her head. He said that he knew she wasn't a good close-range fighter, and her enslaving magic did not work on her either. She was shocked and in denial. Kai had played a gamble, and he won. The reason was Kanzaki. That night when he asked Kanzaki to dominate him, he explained to her that the skill that was casted first would have the priority over the new casted skill. This meant that if she used her domination power on him first, then it would negate the enslaving magic. And since candidates had divine protection, therefore their powers were superior to magic. Kanzaki was in doubt as her skill was weaker than Leonora's magic. The same thing happened with Steady. Since he had casted his spell before her, therefore he was able to regain control over his monsters. It was a gamble, but they had no other chance. In the present, Leonora realized that it must be Kanzaki, and she was correct as Kai was under her spell. He told her that it was her end and was about to pull the trigger. Leonora was captured and handcuffed. The handcuffs sealed her magic power, and these were the same handcuffs which had previously been used on Kanzaki. She asked Kai what he was planning to do with her. His demand was simple, which was that if she would send them back, then he would release her. She apologized as it was impossible for her as all she could do was summon magic. To send them back, a different magic was required. Kai knew she was not lying because she had no skills to send them back. He asked her then how she was supposed to send them back after they defeated the Demon King. She explained that summoning needed an immense amount of energy so they relied on their god to summon them. In other words, it was the god who had summoned them. Once they defeat the Demon King, the god himself would send them back. But she did not seem sure about her claim because no previous candidates were ever sent back. This was because they were killed by the Demon King. There might be some survivors, but they went missing. After a short conversation, Kai was ready to kill her, but Shuji stopped him. Shuji told him that he was cooperating only because he thought that Leonora could send them back, but since she could not, then he would like to keep his status of hero candidate. He did not want to become a traitor in that world. Kai asked if they weren't already traitors now. Leonora assured him that she would pretend that nothing happened that night. Shuji said that the crime of killing a saintess was heavy and they could get in trouble for it. The other candidates also agreed with him. Narumi was still on Kai's side. Shuji agreed that killing her was the sensible thing to do, but what would they do after they would kill her? Kai understood Shuji's point of view, but in an unexpected turn of events, he shot Leonora right between her eyes. Everyone was shocked to see that. Leonora's body fell to the ground and Kai used his smoke grenade and disappeared from there. Candidates were not happy with his decision and actions. Kanzaki thought that it actually came down to what he had planned earlier with her. Few hours ago, when Kai and Kanzaki were planning, he told her that the first objective was to capture Leonora and find a way to get back home, but if it was impossible, then he would kill her. He knew that if he captured her and they could not return to their world, then Shuji would try to protect her, and at that point he would kill her and run away. He was planning to bear the sin of killing the Saintess alone. He said that that was the reason why he left a few of her guards alive so that they could put the blame on him. He told her to put all the blame on him and return to the Empire. She was not sure that she could do it, but he told her that she could, and she may even use her powers during negotiation to make it all work. She asked him where he would run away to. He told her not to worry about him. Meanwhile, far away in a dark castle, a man was updating about his failed attempt to kill the hero candidates to the Demon King. Demon King told him not to worry, as at the end the hero candidates would definitely show up at the front line. The game was getting interesting, and the Demon King was liking it. Two days after the incident, Kai was living in the forest, he was close to a city and it would take him half a day by foot to reach there. Since there was no way he would be allowed entry after killing the Saintess, he decided to sneak in at night. He needed to earn some money and he saw a tavern. Inside the tavern, it was a lovely atmosphere and someone asked him where he was from. He lied that he was from a nearby town and now he was looking for a job. The man advised him to be an adventurer. He would have to take jobs from the guild and would be paid for it. He also told him that the guild was in dire need of new adventures, so they would not even ask for identification. He stayed at an inn, and gladly no one recognized him there. He then went to the guild of that town, and saw all kinds of people there. He went to the reception counter, and got himself registered. He was asked about his name, age, and origin, so he used his false name Siren, and he lied that the Demon King's army had destroyed his town. Siren was the same code name which he used in the real world, too. The receptionist explained to him how the guild worked. There were ranks from A to F. The higher someone was, the higher was the reward. Since he was new, he was registered as an F-rank adventurer. 
He then went to the bulletin board to take his first task, and soon three guys came to pick on him. They were making fun of him, and he really did not like it. Last time, we saw that Aragi Kai was surrounded by some adventurers who asked him not to take the quest. Aragi Kai calmly turned around, thanked them for the warning, and asked them to leave him alone. Hearing this, the boys got frustrated, thinking that Aragi Kai was very cocky. Seeing them surround him, people murmured that those guys were picking a fight with a newbie again. So, one of the boys tried to attack Aragi Kai, shouting that Aragi Kai needed a lesson. But to his surprise, Aragi Kai blocked the attack by grabbing his hand. The boy was shocked and shouted at Aragi Kai to let go of his hand. Aragi Kai calmly released it because he didn't want to fight. However, the boy then told his partners to attack Aragi Kai together and teach him a lesson. They all tried to attack together, but Aragi Kai easily defeated them and calmly left the guild. As he was leaving, he thought to himself that at least he now knew the level of the average adventurers in the guild compared to hero candidates. It was surprisingly very weak, so he decided to finish the quest as quickly as he could. The scene then shifted to the forest, where Aragi Kai thought that, according to the quest's information, the kobolds should be nearby. Suddenly, he noticed animal-like footprints on the ground. Aragi Kai followed them, and as he went further, he sensed that someone was around him, and there was more than one. Aragi Kai also noticed that the mysterious creatures were pretty good at hiding, making him suspect they were kobolds. Out of nowhere, a kobold came up from behind and launched a sneak attack, but Aragi Kai sensed it and easily dodged. He also noticed that the kobold had a human sword in its hand, which meant it had probably defeated an adventurer. While he was thinking, another kobold came from behind and tried to attack. This time, Aragi Kai dodged and picked up some dust from the ground, throwing it into the kobold's eyes. While the second kobold was blinded, Aragi Kai struck the first kobold in the face. As it fell to the ground, he grabbed the sword and swiftly finished it off. Seeing this, the second kobold was shocked, but before it could react, Aragi Kai attacked and swiftly dispatched it with a knife as well. Aragi Kai then used his judgment skill to check the stats of the kobold and realized that these creatures posed no threat to him. Feeling confident, he decided he could easily hunt them down for more money. After some time, the scene shifted to the guild where everyone was looking at Aragi Kai in shock. Aragi Kai had brought the kobold's ears as proof of his subjugation. He asked Mia, the receptionist, if it was enough. She responded affirmatively and asked if he was sure he had really done it alone. Aragi Kai responded with a yes, explaining that hunting kobolds was very easy, but finding them had been the challenging part. He reflected on how, even though he had the skill to fight them, his exploration skill was still lacking. Upon seeing Aragi Kai return after defeating the kobolds, people around him were shocked and asked if kobold hunting was such an easy feat, speculating that Aragi Kai might have been a C-rank hunter from somewhere else. However, someone else mentioned they had heard Aragi Kai was still a newbie. Mia interrupted, asking Aragi Kai to wait while she went inside to prepare his reward. The scene then shifted to nighttime, where Aragi Kai was walking somewhere, counting his money. He wondered that he could earn so much by hunting those weak magic beasts, realizing that for now, securing funds for living was more important. So, he decided to stay in the city and earn money as an adventurer. Aragi Kai thought that building a network around the guild would help him gather information easily. Suddenly, someone appeared in front of Aragi Kai. Seeing the boy, Aragi Kai asked if he had any business with him, noting that the boy seemed much stronger than those he fought at the guild. The boy introduced himself as Lyle, a B-rank adventurer and the person in charge of the guild branch in the city. Aragi Kai responded with a casual, So what? Lyle then asked Aragi Kai if he was the same person who had caused trouble for his men earlier that day at the guild. Aragi Kai responded, saying that those boys were the ones who started the altercation first. In response, Lyle furiously shouted at Aragi Kai, asking him not to lie, as he had heard that an unknown newbie had beaten up his men. Aragi Kai then admitted that yes, he was the one who had beaten them. Hearing this, Lyle shouted that if that was the case, he wouldn't hesitate to teach Aragi Kai a lesson. Lyle then attempted to punch Aragi Kai several times, but to his frustration, Aragi Kai easily dodged every attack. Finally, Aragi Kai got bored and used his legs to trip Lyle, causing him to fall to the ground. Seeing this, Lyle was stunned and exclaimed, What? Aragi Kai then remarked to Lyle that his speed was impressive but unrefined, and his movements were too big, leaving openings. Hearing this, Lyle became furious and tried to attack again, demanding to know what Aragi Kai had said. Aragi Kai once more blocked his attack by grabbing his hand, then swiftly slammed him to the ground. Aragi Kai explained that he believed Lyle wasn't accustomed to fighting against humans because his quests usually involved magical beasts. In response, Lyle angrily asked why Aragi Kai had attacked his men if he had so much power. Aragi Kai responded that he had already explained it was a misunderstanding and offered to clarify everything from the beginning. 
Sometime later, the scene shifted to the guild where Lyle apologized to Aragi Kai, admitting it was his fault. Lyle even scolded and punished his own men for lying to him, acknowledging that it was his fault for not doubting their words. He shouted at his men, demanding that they apologize to Aragi Kai. They reluctantly apologized to Aragi Kai after Lyle insisted. Aragi Kai responded that as long as the misunderstanding was resolved, he didn't mind. He then mentioned that he had a question to ask. Lyle apologized again and assured Aragi Kai that he would gladly answer any questions he had. Aragi Kai then explained that he was a traveler and had registered as an adventurer to earn funds for his travels. Aragi Kai continued, mentioning that he had another reason for registering as an adventurer. Curious, Lyle asked Aragi Kai what he wanted, considering his formidable power and unknown circumstances. Aragi Kai responded that he was looking for a way to travel to another world. Upon hearing this, Lyle and his men were stunned and asked him to clarify. They wondered aloud whether such a thing was possible. One of them speculated that he had heard Hero's candidates came from another world. Aragi Kai confirmed that he was indeed talking about finding a method to enter the world of those Hero candidates. Lyle responded, speculating that if that were the case, it likely involved magic, and they were not particularly familiar with magic themselves. Aragi Kai acknowledged that such information wouldn't be easy to come by, and expressed hope that Lyle and his group might have some clue. Lyle responded that there was possibly only one person who could provide clues, namely, the sage Elbana Karet. Aragi Kai asked in confusion who Elbana Karet was. Lyle was surprised and asked Aragi Kai how he didn't know, explaining that Elbana Karet was an elf whose advice had greatly helped the country. Upon hearing this, Aragi Kai recalled having heard about Elbana Karet somewhere and asked if it was true. Aragi Kai then recalled reading about an elven sage in books before, remembering that elves were known to live deep in forests. He explained that elves were now rare, with their stories considered legends, and they seldom left their forests to explore the outside world. Aragi Kai concluded that the elf who ventured outside their forest and gained wisdom became known as a sage. Lyle added that he had heard Elbana Karet had been alive for over a hundred years, and was renowned for possessing great wisdom and knowledge. Lyle also mentioned that Elbana Karet was a renowned spellcaster with extensive knowledge of spells. Upon hearing this, Aragi Kai wondered if elves were known for their strong affinity with spirits, which aided them in mastering magic. Aragi Kai also considered that even if there wasn't a specific magic to send heroes back to their homeworld, perhaps with spells they could achieve it. Lyle's underling Raka interrupted, asking if the sage Elbana Karat was still alive, mentioning he had never heard of Elbana Karat, and noting that no one had ever seen Elbana Karat, right? Lyle laughed and replied that he didn't have information about that. He then apologized to Aragi Kai for not providing any useful information. Aragi Kai reassured him that the information was indeed useful enough for him. Oragi Kai then mentioned that it was getting late, so he was heading back to the inn. Upon hearing this, Lyle expressed his curiosity, asking Oragi Kai what he planned to do after discovering a way to travel to another world. Oragi Kai smiled and cryptically responded that he would leave that to their imaginations. Confused, they watched as Oragi Kai left for the inn. The scene then shifted to one week later at the guild, where Mia was giving Aragi Kai his reward for completing the quest. After taking the reward and walking outside of the guild, Aragi Kai reflected on how it had already been a week since the incident with Lyle and his group. During that time, he had managed to save up some money. Suddenly, Lyle and Raka approached Aragi Kai and asked if his quest had been completed, suggesting they go for a drink together. Aragi Kai responded with a strange, somewhat sad look and declined their invitation. Seeing this, Lyle remarked that Aragi Kai was very boring and they bid him goodbye. While walking on the road, Aragi Kai reflected on how he had finally gathered some information about the sage. He shared that the sage's name was Elbana Karet, and about a decade ago, Elbana Karet had served as the country's advisor. Now retired, Elbana Karet was said to be living near the western border. It's the place where the country was fighting against the Demon King's army. Aragi Kai then concluded that there was no reason for him to stay in the city any longer, deciding that he should go and visit the so-called sage Elbana Karet. The scene then shifted to the Holy Temple City Alpha, where the hero candidates were having a meeting with someone. Heinrich, the captain of the Holy Knight Order's Eighth Knight Corps, mentioned that it had been a month since he took on the responsibility of overseeing the hero candidates, replacing the duties of the fallen saintess. So Heinrich asked Midu Shuji if he had any complaints so far. Midu Shuji responded with a no, indicating that everything was fine because Heinrich was doing a good job. Heinrich expressed his happiness upon hearing those words, stating that the hero candidates were valuable assets to the country, and he treated them with respect accordingly. Hashimoto Murray thanked Heinrich for his concern but couldn't help but feel that he was different from Leonora. Despite this, she sensed something fishy about the situation. Heinrich then directed them to focus on the main topic, 
mentioning that during the previous day's meeting, it had been decided to mobilize the hero candidates. Midu Shuji was surprised and asked if he interpreted correctly that they were being sent to the front line. Heinrich responded with a yes, confirming that the hero candidates were indeed being sent to the front line. He explained that there were still battles ongoing in the western border. Heinrich then showed them a map and explained that they would be mobilized to a fort on the front line. Midu Shuji responded that he understood and was about to ask about the promise. Heinrich interrupted, stating that he would fulfill his promise to protect those who were not suitable for battle. Midu Shuji gratefully thanked Heinrich for his assurance. Heinrich then explained that he would assign them some tasks in the meantime, emphasizing the need for everyone to contribute to earn their keep. Midu Shuji agreed, seeing the practical benefits of having work to do. Hashimoto Mere asked when they needed to leave. Heinrich responded urgently, suggesting they depart the following morning. He also asked Midu Shuji to inform everyone and ensure they were prepared for the journey. After leaving the hall, as Midu Shuji and Hashimoto Mare walked back, Hashimoto Mare expressed her relief that Heinrich had accepted their request. Midu Shuji agreed, admitting he had initially worried their demands were too much, but was glad everything had worked out in the end. Hashimoto Mare speculated that the knights lacked confidence in controlling the hero candidates without Leonora, which might explain their modesty. Midu Shuji agreed, noting that with Leonora gone, the knights would be on high alert. Hashimoto Mare then wondered about Aragi Kai, pondering where he had gone and what he was currently doing. The scene then shifted to the past when Leonora was killed, and Aragi Kai left the hero's candidates. The bishop asked tensely who could have killed Leonora. Nagase Rina responded that the culprit was Aragi Kai, revealing that he was one of the hero candidates. Hearing this, the bishop and his guards were shocked. The bishop urgently asked about Aragi Kai's whereabouts. Nagase Reina responded that Aragi Kai had run away, noting that he was surprisingly fast for a traitor. The guards began discussing among themselves, debating whether they should send an inquisitor immediately if Aragi Kai's betrayal was confirmed, or if they should first verify whether Saintess Leonora had truly been killed. Arashi Shunshuka furiously asked the bishop to clarify what he had just said. The bishop responded, clarifying that he wasn't outright denying the story, but suggesting there was a possibility that all the hero candidates had conspired together to eliminate Leonora. At that moment, Midu Shuji became tense. To everyone's surprise, Leonora's knight stepped forward and explained that he had witnessed the incident. He revealed that Midu Shuji and the others standing there had indeed been trying to protect the saintess, but they were overwhelmed by Aragi Kai, resulting in Leonora's demise. The other knight also agreed with the account, prompting the bishop to state that he could believe it if her own knights were confirming the story. He then inquired about Aragi Kai's strength, asking if he was truly that formidable. Midu Shuji confirmed, saying yes, explaining that Aragi Kai had been concealing his true power all along. The bishop then invited them to have a more detailed conversation in his chamber and requested one of the hero candidates to accompany him. Unbeknownst to them, Kanzaki Rin was secretly eavesdropping from behind a wall, using her abilities on the knights. Midu Shuji felt relieved that they had managed to navigate the situation with Kanzaki Rin's assistance. The scene returned to the present time, where Hashimoto Mare asked Midu Shuji if he was still worried about Aragi Kai, suggesting it was pointless to be concerned. Midu Shuji smiled and agreed outwardly, but admitted that deep down he was troubled because he knew Aragi Kai had sacrificed himself for their sake. Midu Shuji was tense because he had resolved to protect everyone, but Aragi Kai had taken that burden upon himself, leaving Midu Shuji feeling powerless to help Aragi Kai. In the room, Midu Shuji gathered everyone and announced that they had been ordered to mobilize to the front line. He instructed all combat-ready personnel to prepare to depart by the next morning. Some of the boys became tense as the reality of facing a real battle set in. Nagasi Rina approached them and remarked that it was too late for them to be afraid, reminding them that they had willingly chosen to join the combat group. Hano Shiori asked if they weren't the only ones being sent to the front line. Midu Shuji responded that they were being sent together with the 8th Night Corps under the command of Captain Heinrich. Kanzaki Rin asked Midu Shuji if there was any news about Aragi Kai. Midu Shuji explained that the temple had placed a bounty on Aragi Kai's head and had deployed a significant number of personnel to track him down. He added that there had been no news regarding Aragi Kai's whereabouts. Hearing this, Kanzaki Rin became visibly sad. Midu Shuji was about to console her, but before he could, Nagase Rena angrily shouted that she didn't care whether Aragi Kai was a traitor or not. If she found him, she would burn him to a crisp. Kanzaki Rin, feeling deeply upset, wondered why Aragi Kai hadn't taken her with him. The scene then shifted to the jungle, where all the hero's candidates and knights, along with the guards, were traveling. As they went further, Arashi Shunshuke sensed something and stopped. At that moment, Hano Shiori also shouted that she was tired and asked if they could take a break. Hashimoto Mere responds that they just had a lunch break, so it's not possible. It seems they are going to walk until dark, 
Some boys were wondering if anything would happen since they had been walking for the past two days without anything happening. Arashi Shunshuke asks everyone to stop, and they ask if something is wrong. Arashi Shunshuke responds that he can sense the presence of a magical beast behind the bushes. A knight arrives and shouts at the hero's candidates, asking why they stopped suddenly. Midushuji explains that they sensed the presence of a magical beast nearby. The knight shouts that he can't see anything and reminds them that they must follow his orders, as they can't do anything without his permission. Hearing this, Arashi Shunshuke gets furious, grabs the knight by the neck, and demands to know what he said. The knight, scared and tense, asks Arashi Shunshuke what he is doing. Even Midu Shuji urges Arashi Shunshuke to stop. Arashi Shunshuke furiously shouts, asking why he should follow any orders from a worthless knight. Suddenly, something attacks Arashi Shunshuke, forcing him to release the knight to dodge. It's a magical beast with a rabbit face but weaponized hands. The guards get tense and announce that it's a sharp rabbit, urging everyone to prepare for battle. But before the guards could act, the sharp rabbits charged at them, knocking their swords away. One of the sharp rabbits glared furiously at a guard, ready to strike, but before it could harm him, a strong fire flame came out of nowhere and wiped out the sharp rabbit. It was Arashi Shunshuke who used his power to defeat the beast. The guard thanks Arashi Shunshuke for saving him, but Arashi Shunshuke tells the guard to step aside and not get in his way. Arashi Shunshuke then proceeded to easily defeat each of the sharp rabbits one by one. Some students were amazed to see Arashi Shunshuke's power, as it was far more destructive than they had seen before. But Arashi Shunshuke wasn't satisfied, feeling that his power still wasn't enough compared to Aragi Kai's. The scene then shifted to a moment when Aragi Kai had aimed a gun at Leonora. Arashi Shunshuke became furious upon seeing Aragi Kai once again. Arashi Shunshuke was actually frustrated because from the beginning, Aragi Kai had shown no fear towards him, indicating that Aragi Kai was definitely stronger. Aragi Kai's lack of reaction only reinforced this belief for Arashi Shunshuke. Arashi Shunshuke then shares that with the explosive power he received, he thought he was stronger, but it's very annoying for him to realize that Aragi Kai is even stronger. The scene then shifts to the present where Midu Shuji interrupts Arashi Shunshuke's thoughts, asking what happened to him as he seemed to be in a bad mood. Arashi Shunshuke responds that it's nothing, but he doesn't like being ordered around by someone he considers worthless. Sometime later, the scene shifted to the western border of Digarest Holy Kingdom at Fort Truss. Initially, Captain Amelia of the Holy Knights introduced herself as the leader of the Knight Order stationed there. Heinrich asks Amelia what happened to the watchdog captain. Amelia responds that he died around a week ago. Upon hearing this, the hero's candidates were a little bit shocked. Amelia then mentioned that she wanted to let them rest first after their long trip, but she couldn't finish her sentence. The guards interrupted, shouting that the army of the Demon King was coming to attack. Amelia cheerfully remarks that as they all heard, there's no time for rest, so she's counting on them. Midu Shuji agrees and instructs every hero's candidate to prepare for battle. Irashi Shunshuke appears very determined and ready for the upcoming fight. The guards rang the alert bell, shouting that the demon army was approaching. The quantity of monsters was large, which stunned Max and made him wonder why there were so many monsters. Heinrich instructs the guards to start firing and reduce the number of monsters before they get closer. The guards begin shooting arrows, while the fire ability knights also hurl fireballs at them. Despite all the fireballs and arrows hitting the monsters, they continued moving forward, proclaiming their intent to destroy the humans. Midu Shuji was shocked to see that the monsters were not retreating, despite taking heavy hits. Amelia explained that the monsters wouldn't be easily defeated by just those attacks. She warned the hero's candidates not to underestimate the monsters' endurance and stamina, emphasizing that humans were much weaker in comparison. Midu Shuji tensely asks Amelia what they should do. Amelia instructs Midu Shuji to follow Heinrich's orders and commands. She states that she will lead the Fourth Order Knights to fight the monsters herself. Heinrich explains that he had intended to say the same thing, but some individuals were already down there fighting the monsters. Midu Shuji, confused, asks Heinrich about whom he was referring to. Nagase Rena informs Midu Shuji that Heinrich was talking about Arashi Shunshuki and his group, as they had already gone down earlier. Midu Shuji was stunned and asked Nagase Rena to repeat what she had just said. So when the smoke cleared, they saw that humans had come to confront them directly. The monsters laughed at Arashi Shunshuke and the others, mocking them as fools who had come to meet their deaths. Arashi Shunshuke replied that he didn't care if they were demons or anything else. He would simply erase the monsters from existence. The fight began between them. Inside the fort, some monsters broke through a wall and attacked the guards. As a monster was about to strike down a guard, Midu Shuji intervened, blocking the attack with his sword. Even the guard was surprised to see Midu Shuji. Midu Shuji then unleashed his more powerful attack, Sword Extend and swiftly defeated the monster. Afterward, Midu Shuji felt confident that he could handle it, realizing that his power was continuing to grow. He then shouts and tells the others that they can see it's a battle they can win, 
so without fear, let's fight. Hearing this, every hero's candidate is filled with enthusiasm for the fight. As Midu Shuji prepares to fight again, he reminds himself not to hesitate, knowing that any sign of hesitation would unsettle the rest of the team, as he was their leader. He reflects on how Arigi Kai taught him the cost of his naivety. Hashimoto Meirei also urges everyone to stop watching and join Midu Shuji in the fight. Nagase Reina begins using his attacks, and Kenzaki Rin starts dominating the monsters. In this way, the battle continues between the monsters and the hero candidates. Seeing the hero candidates fighting, the guards are amazed by their power as they dominate the Demon King's army. Heinrich shouts and instructs the guards to cover the hero candidates so they can push the demons back. They agreed and charged forward, engaging in a long battle until finally defeating the Demon King's army. Amelia joyfully announces their victory, and the guards begin celebrating. As the sunset approached, Midu Shuji remained lost in deep thought. However, he was interrupted by Heinrich, who asked if it was his first time fighting like that and how he felt about it. Midu Shuji responds that it's challenging to learn how to handle battles at such a large scale. He explains that during the battle, his perspective narrowed, making it difficult for him to give orders effectively. Heinrich praised Midu Shuji for his efforts and credited the hero's candidates for their role in winning the battle. However, he cautioned them to remain vigilant because although they had faced mid-ranked enemies with relatively small numbers, the high-ranking demons would pose a different challenge due to their superior capabilities. Midu Shuji, upon hearing Heinrich's warning, becomes serious and assures him that he will remember it. The scene then shifts to the demon den where a monster is reporting the battle to Stone Gaia, one of the four heavenly kings of the demon king's army. The monster apologizes for failing to fulfill his duties, which angers Stone Gaia greatly. The scene shifted to the great forest of Echoed, where Aragi Kai was traveling. As he neared the edge of the forest, he reflected that his journey to visit the sage should also be ending soon. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Aragi Kai felt something coming towards him, tongues aimed at hitting him. He managed to dodge them somehow, noticing their incredible speed and wondered what kind of tongues they were. As he looked around more carefully, Aragi Kai spotted some new magical beasts. Upon scanning them, his system identified them as tongue baboons. After checking their status, Aragi Kai concluded that they were somewhat mediocre creatures. The Tongue Baboons attacked Aragi Kai again, but he easily dodged their assault. However, realizing they were closing in fast, Aragi Kai swiftly displayed his agility by jumping away from the spot to avoid their attacks. The Tongue Baboons attacked Aragi Kai again with their tongues. But this time, Aragi Kai swiftly drew his knife and cut through the tongue in the middle. The tongue baboons were shocked by this move, and Aragi Kai continued cutting until he severed the entire tongue from their mouths. The baboon attempted to attack with its tail, but it was too slow for Aragi Kai, who dodged it easily and swiftly defeated the creature. Witnessing this, the other baboons became stunned and tense, unsure of what to do next. Aragi Kai, now furious, challenged them, asking if they were coming to him or if he would have to come to them and deliver their demise. The scene then shifted to some time later, with the corpses of the tongue baboons lying on the ground. Aragi Kai pondered that more powerful magical beasts seemed to be appearing gradually, wondering if it was because he was getting closer to the Demon King's territory. Or perhaps the forest was distant from cities where knights and adventurers were plentiful. As he ventured deeper, Aragi Kai thought that the further he went, the greater the likelihood of encountering powerful magical beasts untouched by humans. He was grateful that his appraisal skill allowed him to spot some of these beasts. So Aragi Kai decided to remain vigilant for the future. The scene then shifted to some time later, where Aragi Kai finally reached Mount Uragano, a natural defense barrier that slowed down the invasion of the Demon King's army. Aragi Kai then explains that the highest peak is called Reaper Wolf Mountain, and there's a rumor that Sage Alabama lives at the peak of that mountain. He then tried to recall if he remembered correctly that there should be a small village at the bottom of Reaper Wolf Mountain. When Aragi Kai reached the village, he was shocked to see the entire village on fire. He wondered if the village had been attacked by the Demon King's army. As Aragi Kai suspected, the village had indeed been attacked by the Demon King's army. Monsters were standing in the village, and Aragi Kai watched them from the rooftop of a house, hidden from view. Aragi Kai thought that the place was supposed to be far away from the front lines, so he resolved to be more cautious. The monsters asked their leader, named Hector, what they should do, suggesting that massacring the humans should be acceptable. Hector instructs them to cease the massacre and suggest enslaving the humans instead. He then asks if they have gathered any information about Elbana Carrot. The monster confirms this, stating that the sage resides at the top of Reaper Wolf Mountain. Upon hearing this, Hector became frustrated that their intel was correct, which annoyed him greatly. He emphasized that their highest priority was Elbana Caret, the sage. Hector instructed the monsters to rest in the village for the night, and then prepare to climb Reaper Wolf Mountain the next day. A tense monster voices concern, mentioning that Reaper Wolf Mountain is known to be the nesting grounds of the Reaper Wolfen, 
which are untamable beasts. They believe that unless they defeat the Reaper Wolfen, they won't be able to reach their objective. The second monster asks for the reason behind the first monster's statement. The first monster explains that domination magic is ineffective against magical beasts with high intelligence. Additionally, he heard that the four heavenly kings once managed to tame a dragon, but it would be impossible for them to do the same with the Reaper Wolfen. Hector also mentioned that he wasn't particularly skilled in magic, so discussing abilities they didn't possess was pointless. Their only viable option was to defeat the untamable magical beast. The other monsters agreed with Hector's assessment. Seeing this, Aragi Kai concludes that the entire group is well organized under Hector's command, and wonders if this organization is due to the influence of the high-ranking demon. When Aragi Kai checks Hector's status, he learns that Hector is one of the very few high-ranking demons in the Demon King's army. Realizing this, Aragi Kai understands that it would be extremely challenging to confront Hector directly in battle. Suddenly, Hector also felt that someone was watching him, so he instructed the monster to go and investigate, sensing that someone was lurking around. Aragi Kai was impressed to see that Hector's senses were remarkably sharp. The monsters were searching for Aragi Kai, but he was relieved because he was skilled in hiding and lurking. Suddenly, Aragi Kai noticed that some humans had been captured by the monsters. They were all tied up with ropes. Despite seeing the captured villagers, Aragi Kai decided not to intervene as his main objective, like the demons, was to find and meet the sage Elbana Karet. He knew he had to climb the mountain ahead of the Demon King's army. The scene changed to the highest peak of Uragano Mountain, a dangerous area also known as Reaper Wolf Mountain. Agari had somehow climbed to this point. When he checked the map, it showed no established trail, so he decided to follow the paths used by wild beasts. He also noticed that his vision was unclear and the ground seemed unstable. Despite being in a hurry, he chose to proceed with caution. As Agari moved further, he sensed someone's presence nearby and thought it might be the rumored Wolfen of Reaper Wolf Mountain. Listening closely, he discerned not one, but two, no, three, distinct sounds, gradually increasing in number. Agari realized that despite the wolves being hidden, their presence was overwhelming. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Agari found himself surrounded by the wolves on all sides. They were about to attack him, but he quickly jumped up and perched himself on a nearby tree. Agari was stunned to discover the reason why many people had gone missing on the mountain. He then used his appraisal skill to assess the status of the wolves. Upon checking, he found their status to be average, with their main strength lying in their coordination. While Agari was assessing their status, one wolfen charged towards the tree and broke it in the middle. Agari knew he had to act quickly, so he grabbed a leaf, infused it with mana, and then used it to attack the wolfen. Within seconds, the wolfen died after being cut in half. More wolfen tried to attack Agari, but each time he used the leaf to strike them down. Two more were wiped out in the same manner. Now, a group of five, six wolfen were approaching to attack together. So this time, Agari infused mana into his own body. He believed that if he did it consciously, the effect would be significant. He thought this because Leonora had once mentioned that those who relied on divine protection often had weak control over their mana energy. He also remembered Leonora's words, where she had mentioned that those who constantly relied on divine protection were not accustomed to controlling mana at all. In her view, they were nothing but weaklings, which was why she could control them all. That's why they couldn't resist Leonora's enslavement magic back then. Agari knew he had to improve to overcome his weakness. He believed that mastering mana control would also enhance his resistance against enemy magic. He also realized that mana wasn't as powerful as divine protection. But if he wanted to become stronger in this new world, he knew he had to learn it. Agari decided to continue fighting the wolfen and practice mana control while climbing the mountain. Suddenly, Agari sensed something and quickly arrived at that location. He headed towards the leader of the wolfen and upon reaching, he asked the wolfen to confirm. The other wolfen were confused about what Agari was attempting to do. But when the leader wolfen tried to attack Agari, he swiftly defended himself and defeated the wolfen without hesitation. As Agari looked up, he noticed that as soon as he defeated their leader, all the wolfen ran away. After all, it was the strongest magical beast of their pack. After that, Agari chased after the remaining wolfen by himself. Suddenly, to his shock, something special happened. He saw a red-colored copy version of the wolfen. Seeing this, Agari wondered if his skill was predicting the trajectory of the wolves' movements. His guess proved correct. It was indeed predicting the future trajectories. With this ability, he swiftly defeated two more wolves. Agari realized that with his predictive ability, he could see roughly one second into the future. Seeing this, the remaining wolves were frightened. However, Agari told them not to dare run away and instead join him in training a little longer. After some time, Agari had wiped out all the wolves. When he checked his own status, he discovered that his new skill, Divine Protection of Foresight, helped him see the future moves of his enemies. 
Agari then reflected on how, when he received the weak point detection skill, his appraisal skill also leveled up. This progression essentially upgraded his blessings from normal to enhanced, as appraisal now allowed him to see everything in sight. Exhausted, Agari decided to take some rest. Suddenly, he felt something and wondered if the Demon King's army had arrived. He abandoned his plan to rest and hurried towards the source of the presence he felt. The scene shifted to near the mountain peak, where monsters had captured an elven girl named Mare. Hector expressed his admiration for her persistence, noting it was to be expected from a disciple of the sage. He then declared that it was the end for her and ordered his monsters to eliminate the elven girl. Mare was about to say something when she was suddenly attacked by the monster. To everyone's surprise, Agari arrived and swiftly helped her dodge the attack by carrying her in his arms. Mare was stunned to see a human saving her. Confused, the monster asked Agari who he was, whether he was a new enemy. Agari understood that there were a total of ten monsters, with their leader Hector being a high-ranking demon. Mare asked Agari why he helped her. Agari responded by asking if she was a disciple of Sage Elbana Karet. When Mare confirmed that she was, Agari explained that his reason for helping her was because he had some business with Sage Elbana Karet. Agari used his appraisal skill on Mare and discovered that she was half-elf. Additionally, he found that she had a spell skill in her skill set. Hector remarked that he didn't need to ask who the human was, but he was certain that Agari was definitely an enemy. He asks his monsters to kill both the elf and the human. Agari realized that in order to save the girl and earn a favor from the sage, he had to defeat those monsters. The monsters then attacked Agari, and with the help of his foresight ability, he attempted to predict their future movements. His foresight ability proved invaluable, as Agari could predict the monsters' future moves, allowing him to effectively block their attacks. The monsters were shocked, and in a swift motion, Agari swiftly dispatched all of them with his knife. The other monsters were stunned by the scene they witnessed. Agari pondered that as long as his foresight was active in close-quarter combat, he felt invincible. However, his main concern was the duration of the skill and how many minutes he had left. On the other side, Hector instructed his monsters not to charge recklessly, but to use magic to attack the human. The monsters agreed and began shooting magic bullets at Agari. Upon seeing the magic bullets, Agari became tense, realizing the danger they posed. However, to his relief, Mare used a spell from Sylph, the wind spirit, and blew away all the bullets. Agari asked in surprise if it was a spell, realizing the power used by borrowing the strength of the spirits, an art reserved for elves. Mare confirmed it was, and thanked Agari, mentioning that because of him, the spirit seemed able to rest for a bit. Frustrated, Hector declared that they wouldn't win at this rate and decided to join the fight himself. Agari became serious and asked Mare, referring to her as an elf, to stop the rest of the monsters from intervening while he dealt with their leader. Mayer responded that she could handle it, and requested Agari to stop calling her Elf, as her name was Mayer. Agari acknowledged her request and expressed his trust in her, addressing her as the disciple of the sage. Mayer got furious and shouted that her name was Mayer, but soon she became frustrated and asked Agari to forget about it. Here, Agari faced Hector head-on, only to find that Hector was very strong. Despite clashing swords, Agari used Hector's sword to propel himself into the air and attacked Hector with his knives. However, Hector blocked the attack with his own sword. Hector then counterattacked, but Agari dodged swiftly and managed to slash him with the knife. Hector received some damage and admitted he was surprised that Agari predicted his attack, considering it a good attempt. Agari, on the other hand, was shocked to see that the wound wasn't superficial. He became tense, realizing the power of a high-ranking demon, and understood that he would likely be dead without his foresight ability. Hector commented that if Agari were not human, he would have been able to defeat him easily. Agari then used his appraisal skill to check Hector's status and found that in addition to his physical abilities and sharp senses as a high-ranking demon, Hector also possessed a swordsmanship skill level of 5. Agari, realizing he had a significant disadvantage in a direct battle with Hector despite his foresight skill, decided to attempt a new strategy. Hector shouted at Agari that if Agari wasn't going to come to him, then he would come to battle it out. Despite this, Agari managed to dodge Hector's attack somehow. Finally, Agari got cut in his hand by Hector's attack leaving him tense. He realized there was no point in predicting the future if his body couldn't keep up, as the physical gap between them was too large for him to bridge. Hector laughed and mocked Agari, asking if he was only going to run like that. Suddenly, Agari took out his gun and shot at Hector, but Hector easily blocked the bullets with his reflexes, using his hand. Agari saw that, and though he was relieved that the bullets had penetrated Hector's hand and injured him, Hector was stunned. He shouted, demanding to know what kind of device Agari was using, such an impudent device. Furious, Hector attacked Agari, who was prepared to shoot with his gun. However, Hector managed to dodge the bullets and warned Agari not to underestimate him, as he could easily predict the trajectory of the bullets. Agari ran out of bullets, so he threw knives at Hector, who blocked them with his sword. Suddenly, 
Much to Hector's surprise, Agari stopped attacking and silently sat down on the ground. Before Hector could react, Agari threw a bomb towards him. Hector wondered what it was and rushed towards Agari to attack. However, before he could reach Agari, the bomb exploded, shocking the other monsters. Even Mare was surprised to see it and wondered who Agari really was as he displayed such amazing skills. She noted that Agari was dominating against a high-ranking demon, despite being human. On the other hand, Agari was ready with a knife in his hand, realizing he had no ammunition left for the handgun he kept as an emergency and that the grenade had been his last resort. Seeing Hector getting back up, Agari realized that relying on guns and grenades wouldn't be enough to defeat him. Hector was now furious because Agari was using unfamiliar devices in their fight. Hector furiously attacked Agari, who dodged the assault. During this moment, Agari decided to activate his weak point detection skill, but first, he needed to carefully analyze Hector's movements. As Hector prepared to attack, Agari analyzed the future trajectory of the attack and identified its weak point, the neck. Agari positioned himself in advance with his knife ready at that spot. Hector moved forward, unwittingly driving himself onto Agari's waiting knife, which struck him in the neck. Hector was shocked, wondering how Agari had managed to strike him with such precision. Agari acknowledged that weak point detection was a powerful skill, but it drained mana quickly. Feeling suddenly fatigued, Agari sat down on the ground. Agari became tense as he realized he had run out of mana, which was bad news for him. The monsters also noticed that their leader Hector was dead, but seeing that Agari was exhausted, they decided to attack him. Mayer also became tense because her spirits were exhausted, and she wanted to help Agari, at least to repay him for saving her. As the monsters charged towards Agari, suddenly someone cast a fire spell, engulfing the entire group of monsters in flames and wiping them out. Agari noticed that the firepower from the flames was on a different level compared to Nagase Reina's. Suddenly, a voice came from Mayer's side, apologizing for being late. Mayer was happy to see her and addressed her as master. Hearing this, Agari realized she was the sage Elbana Karet whom he had been seeking. Elbana Karet thanked Agari, acknowledging that he seemed to have been trying to help her disciple based on the situation. Agari replies that it was just a coincidence and asks if she is the great sage, Elbana Karet. Elbana Karet confirms with a yes and adds that, compared to before, she is now just old and frail. Agari tried to use his appraisal skill, but his mana was too low. Still, Agari knew that the sage Elbana Karet was very strong and he would never be able to defeat her. So he guessed there was no point in hiding anything. He had to be honest with her. Elbana Karat asked Agari if he had some business with her, and he responded with a yes. Elbana Karat said that there was no reason for someone to come to her without a purpose, and she thanked him for saving her disciple. She promised to do her best to answer his questions. Mayer then asked Elbana Karat if they should head back home, as the area reeked of blood and the wolves might come soon. Elbana Karat agreed with Mayer and asked Agari to come along, saying he also needed some rest. Agari agreed, and while walking with them, he thought that so far the situation was favorable and helping her disciple was worth it. The scene then shifted to some time later when Agari and the others arrived at Elbana Karet's house. After entering, Mare said she was going to take a bath. Agari then asked Elbana Karet why she was living in such a remote place. Elbana Karet responded that she had several reasons, but mainly because she wanted to return to nature. Even during her retirement, many people tried to take advantage of her. Agari responded that he understood since her home wasn't easy to visit. Elbana Karat shared that sometimes skilled people like him do come to her home, and she wasn't an evil person who would reject those who seek her out. Agari directly told her that he was one of the hero candidates entrusted with the mission to subjugate the demon king. Elbana Karat responded by saying that they were the third generation of hero candidates. She also mentioned that she had heard rumors but never expected that they had already been summoned. Upon hearing about the third generation, Agari was stunned and then recalled Leonora's words implying that they had summoned several hero candidates before. Ilbana Karat mentioned that they had also summoned hero candidates roughly four years ago, which was their second summoning. The first summoning had occurred about ten years ago. She shared that both generations of hero candidates had gone to subjugate the demon king and were annihilated in the process. Since then, the ritual of summoning had been sealed off and was never to be used again. However, Saintess Leonora was planning to break the taboo and summon the third generation. Elbana Karat also said that she opposed the idea because she believed it was reckless to entrust the fate of a country to someone from another world, regardless of whether it was a god's wish or not. Agari calmly shared that he had already taken care of Leonora, so they shouldn't be able to perform another ritual to summon people from another world. Upon hearing this, Elbana Karat found it hard to believe because she thought it was impossible for him to defeat Leonora. Agari smiled and replied that there are several ways to defeat someone, even with a large gap in skill and power. Hearing this confidently, Elbana Karet laughed and responded that it seemed true, but it was still amusing for Leonora to be defeated by her own pawn. 
Elbina Carrot asked if she should say that Leonora had reaped what she sowed. She also mentioned that she understood Agari's wish now, as it was natural for someone to want to return home. She then said that she didn't like talking too much, so she would get straight to the point. She couldn't send them back to their home with her spells. Upon hearing this, Agari was shocked and saddened. He asked if she still had any clues about how they could return home. Elbina Carrot shared that summoning with human magic should be possible, but sending someone back wasn't feasible anymore. That knowledge had been lost for ages, as there was no reason to research it further. Agari mentioned that Leonora had said the same thing, and asked if in short, they had to defeat the Demon King and there was no other option. Elbina Carrot responded that it was likely the case, or perhaps with the aid of some demonic arts, it might be achievable to some extent. Upon hearing about demonic arts, Agari said he guessed he needed to investigate that next. Elbina Carrot apologized for not being able to help him further, and expressed her gratitude for him saving her disciple. She promised that if she found anything useful, she would let him know. Agari thanked Elbina Carrot for her words. In response, Elbana Karet smiled and suggested that perhaps he might be able to defeat the Demon King. Agari replied that he didn't want to undertake such troublesome work, but if there was no other choice, he would have to defeat the Demon King. Seeing the rage and killing intent on Agari's face, Elbana Karet became tense and thought that Agari seemed different compared to the other hero candidates she had encountered so far. It felt like he had grown up in a place that was dark and cold. Lastly, Agari thanked Elbana Karet for her time and asked her to contact Siren from the Adventurer's Guild if she found anything useful. Elbina Carrot then decided to entrust Mayor to Agari. Just as Mare emerged from the bathroom after her bath, she suggested to Agari that he should also take a bath, considering he must have gotten dirty after climbing the mountain and the battle. Agari agreed with Mare, saying he thought she was right, and decided to take a bath. Elbana Carrot interrupted them and told Agari that she had a suggestion. Agari asked what it was. Elbina Carrot then asked Agari why he didn't bring her disciple on his journey. Mayor was stunned and asked if by disciple, Elbina Caret meant her. The scene then shifted to Veldora Demonic Kingdom's eastern region, the frontline battlefield with the Holy Kingdom of Degarest, where Agari and Mayor were heading towards a destination. It seemed Agari had to take Mayor with him on his journey. Agari praised the weather and mentioned that he had heard the weather in the demonic territory was harsh. Mayor responded that the place where they were standing used to be the territory of the Holy Kingdom until recently and the harsh weather should be even more severe deeper into the Veldora kingdom. Agari understood that the territory had been invaded by the Demon King's army. Mayer also mentioned that around the western region of the Uragano mountain range, there's a big city called Neutrat, and there should be villages around that city. She also mentioned that currently, the city had fallen to the Demon King's army and had become the front line, which was their destination. She estimated it would take them about two days of walking to reach there. Agari hesitantly asked what had happened to the people who were living in that village. Mayor sadly responded that half of the population had been killed, and the other half were enslaved by the demons to perform forced labor. Some people managed to escape to the other side of the mountain. Upon hearing Mayor's account, Agari nodded in understanding and admired her knowledge, feeling that bringing her along on the journey was the right decision. The scene then shifted to the past when Elbana Karet asked Agari about taking Mayor on his journey. When Agari initially declined, Mayor was shocked and shouted at him to at least consider her. Elbana Karet started laughing after hearing Agari's comment and advised him not to speak like that. She pointed out that for someone who had recently arrived in this world, Mare would be quite useful due to her extensive knowledge passed down through generations. Elbana Karet also mentioned that she had been looking for an opportunity to send Mayer on a journey, but she was concerned about sending her adorable disciple alone. Hearing this, Agari looked confused and asked Elbana Karet why she was still entrusting Mayer to him, since Elbana Karet could have taken Mayer out on her own. Elbina Caret responded that she no longer had the capability to embark on journeys herself. Despite appearing young and healthy from a human perspective, her time and abilities were limited, and then someone suddenly appeared and saved her disciple's life. Mayer also expressed her appreciation, but she needed time to think. Before Mayer could finish her sentence, Agari interrupted and stated that he was planning to infiltrate the demon's territory, warning that it would be a dangerous journey. He emphasized that if Mayer were to slow him down, he would leave her behind. So Elbana Caret approached Mare and reminded her that ultimately it was her decision, as it was her life after all. Mare focused on the phrase, her life, and exclaimed that she understood, declaring that she was ready to go with Agari. The scene returns to the present, where Agari tensely commented that Mare seemed tired. He reminded her that they still had a full day of walking ahead, in case she hadn't realized. Mare asked him not to expect too much from the body of a spellcaster, as she had been training herself physically the entire time, despite her magical focus. So Agari suggested they call it a day and rest. Hearing this, Mare was surprised and asked if he hadn't said he would leave her behind if she slowed him down. Agari asked Mare what kind of nonsense she was talking about, reassuring her that he wouldn't leave her behind for such a reason. He then asked her to hurry up and set up the camp. 
Mayer was impressed by his response and replied that she understood and would set it up in a few minutes. The scene then shifted to nighttime, with Agari and Mayer sitting around the bonfire. Mayer was eating and Agari was staring at her hesitantly. He then mentioned that she probably already understood, but the journey would soon become dangerous. And he wouldn't hesitate, even if the journey became dangerous, because he was determined to return to his home world. However, he acknowledged that Mayer might not have as compelling a reason to join him so far. Agari then asked if he was correct in assuming that Elbana Carrot wasn't lying, and that Mayer had her own reasons for joining him. Mayer responded that she didn't know how to explain it well, but she had experienced loss. Her previous home, the Elven Village, had been destroyed by the Demon King's army. Upon hearing this, Agari asked if the war was supposed to be between humans and monsters. Mayer responded that such distinctions were trivial, as the demons overwhelmed all races. She explained that her father, mother, and even her little brother had been killed. She survived because her father sacrificed himself as bait to distract the monster's attention. She also recounted that during that time, she couldn't do anything to help, and after the Demon King's army left the village, she was left for dead. It was then that Elbana Carrot found her and took her in, becoming her master and mentor. Agari stated that he wasn't interested in her past, he just wanted to know her goal. Mayer responded that he should have deduced it from her story. The reason she became Elbana Carrot's disciple and a spellcaster was to gain the power to defeat monsters. Mayer's eyes filled with fury and vengeance as she declared that everything she had learned from her master over the past ten years, including her training, was all for the sake of revenge. She vowed to personally wipe out the man who had killed her family with her own hands. Agari was surprised and asked for the name of the demon. Mayer responded that it was one of the four heavenly kings, Wimberg, who was known as the heavenly king of the wind and also one of the highest leaders in the demon king's army. Agari then asked if the reason Mayer agreed to join him was to get closer to Wimberg. He also mentioned that for now, he didn't have any personal reason to fight against the demons. Mayer also mentioned that she didn't understand why Elbana Caret had given her permission after meeting Agari. Since they were discussing their masters, she admitted she didn't know what Elbana Caret was thinking, which was why she would follow Agari's instructions for the time being. Agari responded that he understood her situation. He then recalled Elbana Caret asking him to take care of Mayer, confident that he could handle her. Agari then understood why Elbana Caret hadn't allowed her disciple to go on a journey alone. Mayer might have risked her life aimlessly pursuing revenge. Mayer apologized to Agari for bringing up such a heavy topic and reassured him not to worry, as she didn't want to involve him in her quest for revenge. Agari understood that Mayer was determined to pursue her revenge herself. He asked Mayer to end the conversation and go to sleep, as they had to travel the next day. Mayer agreed and mentioned that she would set up spirits to keep watch. They would alert them if any monsters approached. While Mayer slept peacefully, Agari pondered about the four heavenly kings of the Demon King's army. He observed Mayer sleeping soundly, then quietly exited the tent. He reflected on how his previous enemy had been a high-ranking demon, and now he faced another one even stronger. Realizing they needed to become stronger before facing such powerful foes, Agari quickly decided to set aside those thoughts for now. He recognized that worrying about that wasn't productive at the moment. The scene shifted around the western corner of the Holy Kingdom's fort, where the high-ranking officials said that now, with the hero's candidates, it's the right time to go on the offensive. Others agreed and asked where they should begin their attack. Amelia also said that attacking Fort Arliss would be a good start. It used to be their fort, so this is a chance to take it back since it is currently their frontline base. If we break them, the enemy will retreat for sure, said Heinrich. He responded that it was a reckless plan, noting that they had been on the defense until now, so why were they suddenly going on the offensive? The high-ranking officials asked Heinrich what would happen even if those hero candidates were his subordinates. Amelia said that Heinrich had a point, but the enemy might still be underestimating them for now, so they wouldn't expect a sudden offensive. She then asked Midu Shuji if his body had been discovered. Midu Shuji responded with a yes, adding that if they told him to fight, he would wield his sword. After that, Heinrich, Midu Shuji, and Hashimoto Mere headed back. Heinrich said that the plan would be executed the next day, and noted that it was rare for Amelia to be this aggressive. Hashimoto Mare asked if Heinrich thought the plan would go smoothly, noting that everyone was pretty confident back there. Midu Shuji responded that if they were going to do it anyway, it was good to be on the offensive while the enemy was still regrouping their forces. So, he believed it wasn't a mistake. Heinrich responded that they were relying too much on the hero candidate's power and abilities, which made them overconfident. He also said that although they were only reinforcing their defenses outside of their command, they couldn't disobey an order from the higher-ups. Hashimoto Mere asked tensely, We didn't have any choice, right? Heinrich responded, Of course, I'll still support them as best as I can, but the hero candidates are still the key to this operation, so please tell them to get a good night's sleep. 
Suddenly, Midu Shuji became tense and wondered what was happening, as he suddenly had a bad feeling about it. But they didn't have any other choice. The scene then shifted to the next day near Fort Arliss, where the hero candidates and Heinrich with his team were ready to attack the fort. Nagase Rina asked why they were attacking at that hour when it was bright and morning. She questioned if a surprise attack would be more effective at night. Heinrich responded that demons could see clearly in the dark, so attacking at night might actually put them at a disadvantage. Midu Shuji mentioned that he wanted to confirm their goal, to defeat the monster's leader while the main force distracted the monsters. He pointed out that the monster's leader was likely to be a high-ranking demon. Midu Shuji told the hero candidates that he would take the lead when the battle started. He instructed them that if he wasn't nearby, they should either buy him some time or retreat. Just then, a guard approached Heinrich and informed him that there was a message from the main force, indicating it was time to begin the operation. Heinrich instructed Midu Shuji and the others to charge in. Without hesitation, everyone attacked the fort and stormed inside. Amelia shouted for everyone to annihilate the monsters. Unbeknownst to them, their actions were being observed by Stone Gaia, the king of the demon army. The scene then shifted a few seconds later, where Heinrich and some hero candidates entered the main tower of the fort. The monsters inside were stunned and attempted to attack, but Midu Shuji swiftly cleared them out in a matter of seconds. Heinrich cautioned Midu Shuji not to let his guard down, as there was still a high possibility that the enemy's leader was in the hall. Suddenly, they found themselves surrounded by monsters from both sides. Some hero candidates asked Midu Shuji what they should do. Heinrich then instructed Midu Shuji to leave their back to the Eighth Knight Order and proceed toward their goal. Midu Shuji agreed with Heinrich's plan and called Negase Reina. Nagase Reina confidently replied that Midu Shuji didn't need to tell her, as she knew her role was to eliminate the monsters standing in their way. She unleashed her power, and the others joined in, swiftly defeating the monsters in front of them. Finally, when they opened the big door, they were stunned to see a humanoid figure. Sam tensely asked, What the hell is this now? Arashi Shunshuki also asked the Demon King if this figure was their leader. Stone Gaia then revealed that he was one of the four heavenly kings of the Demon King's army. Kanzaki Rin and Hashimoto Murei became tense upon hearing this. Midu Shuji also felt uneasy, realizing that the pressure emanating from Stone Gaia was far from normal. Stone Gaia drew his sword and challenged them to see who was stronger. Midu Shuji instructed everyone to get ready, but deep down he was trying to muster his courage. He knew that if they were defeated by Stone Gaia, the sacrifices made by the main force would be in vain. So they were all ready to fight, but instead of attacking, Stone Gaia sat down and touched the ground. Midu Shuji was confused, but to their surprise, an orange circle appeared around Stone Gaia. The hero candidates became tense upon seeing it. Dirt surged from the ground, summoning numerous golems that appeared before Raka and the others, shocking them. Stone Gaia then commanded the golems to attack and eliminate the hero candidates. Midu Shuji instructed everyone to hold off the golems. Narumi Yoshia responded affirmatively and began attacking with his nature power, cutting down golems with sharp leaves. Arashi Shunshuki also joined in, punching through the golems with fire blasts. Arashi Shunshuki laughed and remarked that no matter how many golems there were, those slow-moving creatures were nothing for them. However, Stone Gaia then used his magic, causing the broken golems to regenerate their bodies. Upon seeing the golems regenerate, the hero candidates were surprised and wondered how it was possible. Nevertheless, they resumed the fight, breaking down the golems only to witness them regenerate again. There was a moment when Raka was about to be accidentally struck by a golem, but to his relief, Kenzaki Rin used her domination attack to take control of some golems. However, when another person attempted to strike one of the golems, to their surprise, the golem still managed to strike back. Hashimoto Murei attacked furiously with her telekinesis, destroying the golems. However, to their frustration, the golems began regenerating again shortly afterward. Arashi Shinshuki expressed frustration, realizing there seemed to be no end to the golem's regeneration. At that moment, Narumi Yoshia recalled similar situations from manga he had read before, where defeating the summoner was often the best strategy in such cases. Narumi Yoshia suggested to Midu Shuji that they handle the golems and advised him to focus on confronting the main demon king instead. Midu Shuji responded that he understood, and he and Arashi Shunshuki would deal with the summoner. They charged furiously toward Stonagaya to attack. Stonagaya smiled and remarked to the hero candidates that they were underestimating him. Stone Gaia used magic again, summoning stones from the ground and hurling them toward Midu Shuji. Midu Shuji tensely tried to dodge the attack by running, but to his shock, the stones followed him wherever he moved. Midu Shuji found himself unable to avoid the stones and was hurt by them. Seeing this, everyone shouted his name in concern, but Midu Shuji reassured them that he was all right. Unbeknownst to Stone Gaia, this was actually a distraction by Midu Shuji to allow Arashi Shunshuki to sneak up behind him for a surprise attack. They succeeded in their plan 
and Arashi Shinshuke managed to sneak up behind Stone Gaia and deliver a powerful punch infused with his full flame power. Everyone watched in anticipation, wondering if Arashi Shinshuke had managed to defeat the Demon King. But when the smoke and dust cleared, it revealed that Arashi Shinshuke had collided with a wall made of dust and clay. To everyone's surprise, the wall then attacked Arashi Shunshuke like a punch to his stomach, causing him to faint. Stone Gaia laughed mockingly and asked if that was all the hero candidates had in them. As the story took a brief pause, what do you think will happen next? Will Midu Shuji and the others be able to defeat Stone Gaia, or will they all perish by his hands?